Ahem. <clears throat> Boy, Pokemon sure had a rough transition to 3D! I mean, people say that, but Pokemon games have never been super well-received at launch. People didn't like black and white for being so much more linear than earlier games, and need I mention the people who did and still hate object Pokemon on principle? Ruby and Sapphire only had one region compared to Gold and Silver's two. Some people hated how Gold and Silver were going to add 100 new Pokemon. And, like, the church hated Gen 1 if you count that. His tail. It's a lightning bolt. And it's a satanic Z. But Sword and Shield. These games were much, much different. Of course, there were controversies before they even came out. The dex cut, the reasons for said dex cut, what appeared to be a general lack of polish. And heck, some of these controversies ended up just being how the series was going forward. But then came the launch of the game, where some people, and even critics, loved it, and still do. While others went as far as to say the one-two punch from Ultra Sun and Moon into this completely destroyed their faith in the franchise. And Let's Go was in there too. And me? I remember really liking this game when I first played it back in 2020. It was a nice return to the series for me after taking a break from it for about three years. But then, in retrospect, this game made a lot of weird decisions. So I decided to replay the entire thing, taking mostly everything in again. And I'll say it right now, Sword and Shield do have a lot of genuinely fantastic elements, but at the same time, lots of pitfalls and genuinely terrible elements. I am going to be recapping the whole journey while stopping at points to elaborate on things as they come up or just to give my thoughts. This also means I won't be talking about the characters until they progress their arcs a little more, so stay tuned for that. I know some people don't like simple recaps, but this isn't a simple recap. It's a long-winded one. So here we go, I guess. Let's talk about Pokemon Sword and Shield five years too late. So we boot up the game and... Man, choosing your starter is hard. As is standard, we get to pick our character, or really, skin color. And I picked Gloria because she's the funny one that swears a lot, and also Victor looks like a nerd. But also, this character selection is completely disconnected from everything else. Usually there's a what do you look like from the professor or something, but this is just a non-diegetic menu. It's not really a negative, and as we'll see, it wouldn't fit well into the traditional welcome to the world of Pokemon speech, but it's still something I noticed. But after all that boring stuff, we start for real. And I'll be honest, this game opens strong. Really strong. It feels bombastic, it feels grand. The camera work displays such a grandiose scale, very befitting of the first brand new mainline Pokemon game on consoles. This gentleman, Chairman Rose, is animated pretty well while he gives his speech, barring the times where he pauses before you press A, that looks kind of weird. And following that, the spectacle of Champion Leon's Entrance in front of this huge crowd in a packed stadium, only to be challenged by another person, Raihan, tells us almost everything we need to know about this game just like that. This game is about spectator sports! Ah! And at the very end, we see an iconic Pokémon Charizard, again, do a Dynamax going straight into the logo. This intro really provides a fantastic amount of personality, spectacle, and intrigue to get you ready for a Pokemon adventure. It's one of the better intros in the series, even if the competition isn't very stiff. Like, of course, I'd rather this than The Void. But after all that praise, I'd be remiss to not mention the one big thing that holds it back quite a lot. That one thing being... No voice acting. Rose, Leon, and Raihan here flap their lips alongside the words, but no sound comes out. And that's not just because my capture screwed up and didn't record audio for the first 12 hours of the game. Look, voice acting isn't a necessity, but for a scene like this, where the dialogue is specifically timed to the character animations, the silence seems... really cheap. And it's really jarring that we can still hear the crowd cheering over all this. But again, it's not really a huge deal, and considering this game takes place in the UK, I can always just play Xenoblade for my British people fix. I failed. And last thing for this intro, it being so strong kind of ties into the game's main theme of strength. Now, what the hell am I talking about? Well, we saw quite a few interviews around the Sword and Shield hype cycle, and as interviews tend to do, they give us a bit more insight on the game and the developer's thought process. And one of the things that was shared was the game's main theme being strength. I just thought that was neat to mention, and I'll be bringing up the interviews again from time to time, so uh, watch out for that. Turns out that was a video on our phone. We're interrupted by one of the best characters in the series, and we step outside. And, you know, despite what so many people have said so many times, this game's visuals are honestly... almost perfect. People love to bring up the same three or so examples to say the game looks bad, and it's still 90% about this tree. Look, it's even up on the models resource. But as a whole, this game is vibrant and lively as all hell! The environments look so vast and really well detailed and distinctive. We'll talk about the visuals more as they come, but yeah, I think they're really good. Th that pop-in there, though? That's certainly odd, but... Yeah, we'll get to that. 
This opening sequence isn't too out of the ordinary, if not a bit long. There's a sheep giving itself a concussion, Hop's older brother might have a gift for us, man, I wonder what that could be. Lots of people aren't fans of how the modern Pokemon games take forever to get going, and yeah, I get it, and of course a skip button definitely should be an option, but honestly, this isn't too bad. It establishes Leon's fame a bit more, although I'm not sure why his crowd completely tanks the game. Plus, it displays Hop as a general character pretty well. Man, he's so full of life and optimism, I sure hope he stays that way for the foreseeable future. There's even a small detail here, where if you try to go into the grass, Hop tells you off, as expected. But if you try to go in the other side, all the way down here, his text box is different because he's yelling at you from a distance, and that's just kind of charming. But yada yada, we get back to Hop's place, and it's time for the choice. What are we, choosing our language again? And this cutscene is really great, not only as an addition, but also as a cutscene in general. In earlier games, choosing your starter was just kind of then and there. You have three options here, I would say four, but you don't get the option to decline. But here, we get a superbly animated display of their main traits and personalities, to the point where Scarlet and Violet did it too, and I wouldn't be surprised if they did it again going forward. They actually mentioned that in the interview, how the starters are designed more as characters than animals in an ecosystem. And whether or not that's good is up to you, but it's also comforting knowing that there isn't some freaky colony of Inteleon in the wild. There's even a pretty cute reference to the weakness triangle in this cutscene, with Sobble's water hitting Scorbunny, Scorbunny knocking Grookey's berry out of the tree, and Grookey's berry startling Sobble. And the first partner Pokémon themselves are... they're fine. Not the best we've had, but certainly not the worst either. And once the cutscene's over, for the first time since Oras, really, we've been able to save right in front of the starters. Now, this is really convenient if we want to reset for high IVs or a certain nature, as some people tend to do. It's nice quality of life. But it's also really inconvenient if we want to shiny hunt, because they shiny locked the starters! After six generations of huntable starters, some of which following some absurdly long cutscenes, we can't hunt these ones. For no reason. Though there is always the option of breeding, of course. You know, actually, I think this was Game Freak's way of trying to save us. I decided to do a quick poll on Twitter to choose, and Scorebunny won out. I also like to nickname my Pokémon, so say hello to Afton. We have a little barbecue to celebrate, I really want one of those kebabs, and the next morning, it's time to battle, which Hop is, of course, very excited for. His battle animation's great here, it's so exaggerated. This battle is actually kind of different from our standard opening rival fight. See, Grookey isn't exactly Hop's starter. He had himself a Wooloo before the game even started, so this is a 2v1. Granted, even with Hop's two Pokémon, the battle's still very easy, with Wooloo giving your Pokémon a level up and a new move that's super effective against Hop's next Pokémon. But that just makes it flow more dynamically, because it's a genuinely fantastic and subtle tutorial. You only just now got the new move, so it's like it's inviting you to try it on the new Pokémon. It's, again, a lot more dynamic than the games that just kind of hope you pick the super effective move eventually. The battle also looks really nice, too. See, lots of people point out how physical attack animations like Tackle tend to not really have the Pokémon make contact with each other. And yeah, in most cases that is true, but this battle makes a really strong first impression, with Scorbunny running straight up to the enemy and Wooloo rolling and bumping into Scorbunny. It's kinetic, the Pokémon are actually moving! Now, it doesn't really stay that way, but come on, let me have this. And we win! Man, what a great game! It's time to say bye to Mum, but that Wooloo from before broke through the gate. It apparently leads to the slumbering weld, which is built up as pretty mysterious. Apparently, it even messed up the professor's granddaughter, but we've played Legends Arceus by now, we'll be fine. So we enter, and the atmosphere completely shifts. The visuals get a lot more gloomy, fog starts closing in, and this area's music displays the shift pretty well too, going from a pretty calming melody to a choir of haunting howls. Like, we've seen early game forests before, but nothing like this. We even find some wild Pokémon in here, like... <laughs> the fog starts rolling in quickly, and we suddenly find ourselves face to face with a Pokémon forcing us into a battle. And this is a cool set piece. There's a real sense of urgency here, with your attacks going straight through the thing. All the while Hop's panicking, and the fog keeps getting thicker and thicker to the point where it ends up covering the HUD. Eventually, it gets too much for us to handle, and we subsequently... die. Pokémon should do more forced losses like this, then it would finally be a real JRPG. Before Champion Leon rushes in to get us and the Wooloo before out of there, which... Kinda starts a worrying trend in this game, but that'll come up more later. Oh boy, will it come up later. But whatever, now we're off to the Pokémon Lab. And while heading through Route 1, we get a taste of how wild Pokémon encounters work in this game. After people really seemed to like seeing wild Pokémon in the overworld in Let's Go, they decided to implement them here, and it's pretty neat. Not anything crazy, they work exactly how you'd expect them to. Heck, despite Scarlet and Violet being so different, they work pretty much the same there. But Sword and Shield also decided to keep the original random encounters in a sense. Yeah. See, sometimes when you're just going about your business, a spot in the grass will start rustling, not unlike the Unova games or Oras's Dexnav. And by running into it, you'll find a random Pokémon, just like the old games. And pretty often, the Shaking Grass has Pokémon that don't even appear in the overworld, giving you a pretty 
pretty good incentive to check it out. Like, here on Route 1, the grass can have Caterpie, Hoot Hoot, Grubbin, and Blipbug, none of which appear in the overworld. It's a nice blend of old and new concepts, and they balance the Pokémon distribution really well. Anyway, making our way to the Pokémon Lab in Wedgehurst, we meet Sonia, the professor! This assistant. I like how it's established that she and Leon are good friends, to the point of being rivals in the past. It's just a nice bit of character and world building. We get ourselves a Pokedex, of course, and it's not nearly as stylish as Alola's or even Paldea's, but it's slick, I'll give it that. Then there's the obligatory Pokemon Center tour. It's somewhat designed after a pub, keeping to the region's theming. And the town of Wedgehurst as a whole, being the starting town, is pretty small and doesn't really have much to it, but you know what it does have? Customization, and Sword and Shield has some of the best trainer customization in the series. The other games tend to have pretty samey clothing options, like Alola's pretty much only got t-shirts, and Paldea... Well, you're getting shoved in a locker no matter what you choose. But here, there's different kinds of outerwear, tons of unique graphic tee designs, different styles of bags, glasses, hats, gloves, and pants. And that's not even getting to the salon, where, admittedly, it's not on Scarlet and Violet's level, with different eye and mouth shapes or anything. But we do get eyebrow options, eyelashes, quite a few hairstyles with different colors that really pop, and even contacts. You can look like a creepypasta, look like you need medical attention, or even have blue eyes. The possibilities are endless! Well, after I'm done decking myself out, minus the hair because the salon is in the next town, we bump into Hop again. I know I said this opening is mostly standard, and that includes being really handholdy. At least this conversation is a bit important. Hop talks about wanting to do the gym challenge, which we did overhear him mention earlier. But to participate, we have to be endorsed, so we're off to the professor's house to bug her to bug Leon about it, I guess. Route 2 is more of the sit. Oh, Leon immediately stops us to give us the catching tutorial, which is actually optional this time around. I already caught another Pokemon, so he skips over it. That's a nice addition. But like, couldn't Hop stopping us and Leon stopping us be condensed into one cutscene or something so it isn't as stop and go? Like, at this point, tell me that back at Hop's house so I can play for more than 10 minutes. Anyway, on to Route 2 for real. We catch ourselves a low tad named Guh. Fight a couple trainers, get a few items... It's still very much an early game route, but it feels like a natural evolution of the first route with a really nice view of the hills alongside, look at that! Before long we make it down and meet Professor Magnolia! I forgot about Professor Magnolia! Eventually Magnolia convinces Leon to endorse us for the gym challenge, but on one condition, we have to show him a battle worth endorsing us for, and I win! Apparently that satisfied him! Hop just used Growl like 10 times, but whatever, our path to championhood has opened! I'll be honest, I'm not sure why you have to get endorsed considering it's not expanded upon ever, but I guess in a sense it makes the gym challenge feel a bit more grand maybe? But there's no time to dwell on that because suddenly... Yeah, it's a meteor! Get Rayquaza now! No, actually, these are the wishing stars that let you use Dynamax. Remember, like, the... the Charizard? The Charizard that Leon won't stop mentioning? Can you stop that? Now the wishing stars here are lame. Not overall, wishing stars actually have quite a bit of plot relevance, but just... How we get ours sucks. Before Sword and Shield, we had two games that had to find a way to give us access to their gimmick. X and Y had us fight our rival, Caleb or Serena, to earn the last Mega Ring they had. We almost die in Sudden Moon trying to save Nebi, before Tapu Koko saves us and rewards us with a Sparkling Stone. Even Scarlet and Violet give you the Terra Orb more naturally, and that's just given to you by Nimona. Here, though, the magical gimmick item just falls from the sky! See, this would be kind of neat if later there was some reveal that a legendary Pokémon did it or something, but spoilers! That doesn't happen, we just get them. I guess technically Eternatus did it, but it's still ultimately just some random unceremonious natural phenomenon. Hey, at least Hop's excited about it. Admittedly, the way Dynamax is explained and revealed to us, the player, is kinda neat. Nobody ever just says, ah yes, with Dynamax your Pokémon become large, but only sometimes. No, instead we get to see what it is in the intro, Hop and Magnolia mention how it works briefly, and that's really it. This might just seem like they're hand-waving it aside, and yeah, they kind of are. And they go the Mega Evolution route of everyone constantly reiterating how mysterious and secretive it is. But honestly, I think it works better here with how integral Dynamax is to the story and Galar as a whole. Anyway, we're finally off for real. We head to the train station, wave our mums goodbye, and hit the road with this pretty charming cutscene. And this cutscene tells us all about the wild area, which we're going to now since Wulu are blocking the train tracks. Oh god! Or are we going to it? See, this is actually when the game branches out a little bit. If we instead go back to Wedgehurst, we encounter a pretty strange man and a Slowpoke we have to fight. The Slowpoke kind of beat my ass, but now we can access the DLC, the Isle of Armor and the Crown Tundra. 
these vast open worlds that actually redeemed the game for some people. But we're not going to do them right now. You can use them to completely break the game's progression, and that's really funny, but no, not right now. Back on track, Sonia quickly stops us to talk about how being an adult is hard. Yeah. Now, more accurately, she's talking about not knowing what to do with her life, which is oddly existential for pretty early in the game. But never mind that, she gives us the Pokémon Box Link that lets us access our PC from anywhere. And here we are, the wild area. You know, this place was pretty huge in the marketing, and for good reason. This kind of vast open area is exactly what fans wanted from Pokémon for the longest time. And right now, oh boy, is it refreshing to be let loose here after like two hours of cutscenes and tutorials. It's a pretty bold move to just let us off the leash like this. But we aren't completely free just yet. There's still an entire half of the wild area we can't access until later, and also... That. But something we won't have to wait to see is max raid battles. Which I did end up doing later, making the footage out of order, so that's why Afton's a Raboot now. Yippee! Max raids are a really cool concept. Co-op Pokémon battles aren't really anything new, but they've never been done to this scale before, let alone with a bunch of other players. And that's easily the best part of these, the social aspect. Being able to fight and catch one big super spongy Pokémon with your friends or even randoms is a neat experience. Though sadly, I didn't do that for this playthrough. Considering I'd have to buy Switch Online for this account, and honestly now, in 2024, most online raids are the exact same. At least one person brings the shiny Zacian from that event a while back and almost single-handedly wins every time. Though actually, quick side tangent on how you connect with other players in this game. You connect to the internet through the Ycom, and after doing that, a bunch of people show up in the wild area, which is kind of neat. And anything you want to do, like trading, wonder trading, or battles, is just through the Ycom menu too. You can't even search for raid battles here, you have to wait for them to specifically pop up on your feed. So what I'm saying is it's the bare minimum, and Scarlet and Violet copied it and only made it slightly better. Right, sorry, the raids, they're very tedious. Everyone selects their moves, and then they all play out in order based on the Pokémon's speed. It's just how normal battles work. And that's exactly the issue! Each turn can take up to a minute to pass, often more since the Dynamax Pokémon likes to use team-wide debuffs. And multi-hit moves? Those age a person! Every individual hit resets the camera, and then zooms it back in for the hit itself. And sometimes the Dynamax Pokémon will just put up a barrier, artificially making the fight longer! And don't get me started on the teammates! Okay, if your team ends up having four Pokémon faint overall, you lose. When you're playing with actual players, that's usually fine. Sometimes you'll get some kid with their Squovet, but usually your team's competent enough to not die. But if you don't have people to play with, or don't have Switch Online, you're stuck with some random NPCs and their predetermined Pokémon. And these Pokémon are just... terrible! One of them has a Magikarp, and there's one person with a Clefairy that uses Follow Me over and over, guaranteeing that she's going to die. Oh, and if the NPCs faint, that counts towards you losing! Scarlet and Violet's terror raids might be the buggiest thing since, I, I don't know, Bugsy? But at the very least, they go. They progress. The NPC teammates aren't an act of detriment. I don't have to clear my schedule to do a terror raid. Oh, also, I caught a Noibat in the raid. Say hello to- <coughs> Otherwise known as Screech. I would also like to mention how there used to be Wild Area News, which meant there would be a sort of raid event going on. And they were very different from the Scarlet and Violet raid events we get now. Instead of one big boss Pokémon you had to take down, Sword and Shields were usually just fun themes with certain Pokémon being in the spotlight, some with increased shiny odds too. Though a couple times there were boss fights, namely Zero Aura, Mewtwo, and Urshifu, and while you couldn't catch them, they'd give good rewards. And with Zero Aura in particular, if the community banded together to beat enough of them, they'd all be rewarded with a shiny Zero Aura from Pokémon Home. That was a really fun community thing, they should do that more. Though sadly, since Sword and Shield isn't the latest game anymore, they stopped doing them. I mean, technically there's a raid event that's going on from now until the servers shut down, and it really just serves to make some Pokémon more available than they would be otherwise. On a more positive note, this is also where we get to try Dynamax ourselves! Although, I think for the sake of better pacing this long-ass video and staying more thematic to the game, I'll save that for now. I know I'm saving a lot of things for later, but trust me, we'll get to them. After our sampling of open-world Pokémon flavor, we make our way to Motostoke and get a tutorial from Sonya on how to make our own customizable sports cards called League Cards. Two Pokémon Center tutorials in one game, that's impressive! This will be worth millions one day, trust me. This place is actually really cool, visually at least. The steam coming from everywhere, the giant gears not only for decor but also traversal, and the rusty and grey color scheme come together for a nice, almost steampunk aesthetic. We just have to make our way to... Yeah. We bump into Leon who gives us a charcoal to power up Scorbunny's fire moves, I guess it's a nice simple tutorial for held items. Oh, also, don't forget to talk to this guy while you're here, because he gives you the high-tech earbuds. 
They're a key item, and they actually do something really cool. See, they unlock the audio options in the settings. I don't think you can make a funnier joke about that. Why are the audio settings a missable item? Though I guess that's not as bad as making easy mode version exclusive and locking it behind the post game. I try to talk to Ball Guy real quick, but Hop's gravitational pull activates, so I guess it's finally time to sign up for the gym challenge. After this individual pushes past us, I'm sure he'll be important, we're ready to choose our uniform number. This is admittedly a very small thing, but it's still another layer to the great trainer customization in this game. I went for the Pokedex number of one of my favorites, Cherubi of course, so it's time to get ready for the ceremony tomorrow- oh hey that guy. Among all those elite enough to get an endorsement, I'm the most elite of all, so why don't you clear off and try not talking to me again, would you? I'm not doing that again. Anyway, kill this guy. At the hotel, Sonia starts talking about the region's lore and how years ago, a hero saved Galar. And she decides to specifically point out the sword and shield. Hmm. Surely we'll learn more later, right? But that's not all this hotel has to offer. There's also delinquents. A group named Team Yell stopping everyone from checking in purely to give one special trainer the lead, or so they say. And lots of the Pokemon community actively despise Team Yell. I wouldn't call Team Yell and their story bad per se, they're more so just really horribly mishandled. So in other words, yeah, I guess they are kind of bad, and that'll absolutely become apparent in due time. After we beat a couple of them, including a multi-battle alongside Hop, we meet Marnie. Who's the one they're cheering for? And she doesn't seem too enthused by them either, so why doesn't most of the fanbase like her? She's on their side! Well, regardless, she's still doing the gym challenge, thus making her a rival. The idea of having multiple rivals was really soured by X and Y, where the group of four was hardly memorable at all. They were hardly rivals anyway, because Tierno just wanted to dance, Trevor wanted to finish the Pokedex, and Shauna... Shauna was just kind of there, but in a story like Sword and Shield where the main focus is about fighting against other trainers to get to the top, having multiple rivals in Hop, Marnie, and later Bead works. Or at least, it should work. See, instead of feeling like you and your rivals are constantly neck and neck in the gym challenge, we don't see Marnie again until right before the third badge. For a rival who's so determined to beat us and also has ties to the evil team, she is barely present in the story at all. Well, I don't care about that anymore because it's time for the ceremony! We head to the stadium, don our uniforms, and watch as the gym leaders, seven of the gym leaders, reveal themselves. They didn't know how not to spoil the twist with Piers, so they just didn't put him in the cutscene. But really, this is one of the best batches of gym leaders in the whole series in terms of character and design. Some designs may not be for everyone, but they're still crazy unique either way. We step out onto the pitch, oh hey, there's Marnie, and start our journey for real. Can I just say, the idea of expanding on the gyms is so simple, but genuinely so perfect. For the longest time, they've just kind of been... there. Sure, the goal always has been to get 8 badges and beat the champion, but it ended up reaching a certain point around Gen 4, where you were kind of just going across the region and stopping the villains, and the gyms felt completely incidental. Sure, Black and White 1 and Alola had a bit more to it, but nothing to the scale Galar has. The entire gym challenge is portrayed as a seasonal sport between a bunch of people. It's a lot more like how the anime showed battles, instead of just fighting some guy in a dingy room. Berg, I don't think the paint fumes are good for me. It's very thematically appropriate for the region too, with it being based on the UK and therefore their football culture. The ceremony wraps up, we get to meet THE Chairman Rose, I'm honored, and upon stepping outside, we get access to the Flying Taxi, this game's version of Fly. Look, if there's one thing this game does right, it's giving us fast travel early on like any normal video game. Even if there is a stray pixel in the loading icon, that's disgusting. Oh, and there's a big crowd out here too. That really does add to everything surrounding the gym challenge. It really makes you feel like you're setting off on some important endeavor. Man, it's been a while and we still haven't done any gyms, so let's change that. Never mind. Hop's actually the rival that you fight the it's most me, times Hop. in any Pokemon game, with a whopping 10 battles across all the story content. And some people do find it annoying because he stops you so much, and yeah. But there's no denying that it really does make him feel like someone you're competing with. Like, I love Wally, but you fight him twice. He's hardly a rival. Route 3 isn't crazy, a couple trainers, a few new Pokémon, but this place goes for a more rocky, mountainous look. I would say it's another natural evolution, but it's really more of the same. Actually, speaking of new Pokémon, I want to go out of my way to say Galar's new set is fantastic! One of the best regional birds, one of the best regional bugs, probably the best powerhouse Pokémon, uh, the worst rodent. They're all just so creative and unique! Special shoutouts to Obstagoon, Cursula, Phalanx, Frostmoth, and especially Toxtricity. Spoilers, I get one, and the vast majority of them have really strong thematic ties to the UK, like Poltegeist, 
It's Poltegeist. Ruin of Regis is based on a rune stone, which is a sort of memorial to people dating all the way back to the Viking Age. Mr. Rhyme is rather directly based on the one and only Charlie Chaplin. Grimmsnarl is a classic troll from mythology, and the list goes on. It all just adds to Galar's really strong identity as a region. Sonia's on this route, and she points out a factory Chairman Rose owns that provides energy for the region. And not only does Chairman Rose producing energy become important later, but it also shows us how much of an upstanding gent he is. Anyway, she gives us an escape rope, which is a key item now. Neat. And she also gives us a full heal, because these games are rated E for child. No, seriously, there's a Pokemon Center 100 feet to the right, and another girl who heals your Pokemon two feet to the left, so why does Sonya do this? Anyway, we progress a bit more, and after a few more trainer battles, Afton evolves for real. So we decide to celebrate by setting up camp. Pokemon Camp is this game's version of Pokemon Ami or Pokemon Refresh, where you get to play with your little guys. Though you can't pet them anymore, which is a massive shame. Like, even in Scarlet and Violet's picnics, I could pretend I was petting them with a sponge. Instead, we can wave this toy around for them to hit, or even play a little bit of fetch. The highlight, though, is how the Pokemon interact among one another. They'll race each other, fight, or even just have a nice chat. Sure, it's not really as interactive as a me with its Pokepuffs and the mini-games, but it's really fun seeing your team act so lively together. And, like, they really put a lot of thought into this. There's a hidden sociability stat that determines just how much a Pokemon's willing to interact with the team. And if everyone's sociability is high enough, a new wild Pokemon might ask to join your team after you make curry. Oh yeah, curry! There's a little minigame where you put together a main ingredient and some berries to cook a nice curry for your Pokemon. It gives them a chunk of XP, fully heals them, and makes their happiness go up too. And there's quite a lot of ingredients, each giving you a different, very delicious looking curry. I uh, didn't have any ingredients here though, so I just threw in an Oran berry. Anything else would have been too spicy for me. Depending on how well you make it, you'll get a different rank, and I want to point out how good the animations for the best and worst ranks are. Man, I wish the whole game was this expressive. And all the different kinds of curries aren't just for show, because there's an entire curry decks with 151 entries to make. Oh, the national decks is gone, mm-hmm, but did the older games have the curry decks? And speaking of Dexit, I don't really have anything new to add. This was the first game to cut the national decks, and they said it was to update models, but they didn't, or at least not in any noticeable way. Minus the higher res textures. The beta has some Pokemon that didn't make it to the final game, so I don't think the dex cut was always intended. But it did happen, and it really sucked, especially how they handled it. Hey, actually, the leaks, yeah, those leaks, came out while I was editing this. And we didn't get too much about Sword and Shield, which is good, because if we did, I would scrap this whole video. But we did learn about why Dexit happened, actually. Apparently, they made the big decision to cut Pokemon just two weeks before the interview happened. And it's because just a handful of models didn't port from the 3DS to the Switch properly. Wow, what an astronomically terrible situation. They had, like, two more months to finish the game, so it was either crunch even more to fix those models, or just bite the bullet and make the entire fanbase angry. Well, it doesn't matter why it happened, because it still did happen, and it still sucked. I was supposed to be talking about camp. You can even camp with other players or NPCs to watch your Pokemon mingle. So I wish I had walked five more meters on Route 3 before setting up camp. At the end of Route 3 lies Galar Mine Number 1, and this place visually is fantastic. The shining multicolored rocks on the wall are really pretty, and the camera being so close behind you gives off a really cramped feel, almost like Glittering Cave from Kalos. The carcoal riding along the tracks is a great use of overworld Pokemon, and the overall theme here, being a big mine filled with workers, also fits Galar's more industrial theming really well. And remember that factory Sonya pointed out? Well, she also said it's for the resources in this mine, and some of those colorful crystals in there look suspiciously star-shaped. Some might say wish star-shaped, perhaps. It kinda. There's quite a few branching paths that lead to items too, but nothing massive by any means. It's the game's first dungeon, and other early game caves in the series haven't been that extravagant either. There's one part where you go across a bridge with some Wubat, and it looks really cool. There's a huge open tunnel below you that's just begging to be explored. But sadly, there's no way to get to it. Well, surely we'll get more chances to explore later in the game, right? <laughs> Well, we might not be exploring, but we do bump into the snazzy individual from earlier. Say hello to Bede, not like the game reveals his name or anything. We just go from question marks to his name right there, but whatever, he's a fantastic rival regardless. People have been very vocally growing tired of the friendly rival trope, so in response, Bede is just a massive asshole, and it's great! He's got such an inflated ego thanks to being endorsed by Chairman Rose. And hey, there's even some more backstory that gets hinted at, so he's not super one-note. But backstory, tragic or not, he makes you want to defeat him. Like, in the middle of battle, he'll check his watch, the arrogant wow! But you see, I'm the protagonist, therefore I win, and we get to leave this cave. Route 4 is... a bit stupid. First of all, there's another free heal right here because I didn't want to try too hard. I mean, it looks pretty nice. The stone walls and pillars alongside the yellow grass makes it stand out a lot. But like, we don't need to engage with any of that. The town's a straight shot, everything else is on the side. Well, that's not gonna stop me from exploring it. Heck, I even caught a Galarian Meowth! Welcome Mother 3 to the team! 
D does he see me? Okay, it's time to actually go to Turf Field and... We bump into Milo, this town's gym leader. That's another thing this game does right. By simply letting the leaders exist and have scenes outside their designated building, we can get attached to them more. Before we're actually allowed to challenge the gym, Hop tells us Sonya wants to talk up on some hill. And just in case we could navigate this, her yamper tries to lead us in the right direction. And just in case that wasn't enough, the game stops us again to clarify where we should go. I really don't remember the hand-holding being this bad. Sonya talks about this geoglyph that looks like a big Pokémon. Hey, I've seen those before. Dynamax is probably connected to the Darkest Day, which is the thing the hero saved us from all those years back. And that's all. We may not have learned, uh, anything new, but good talk, Sonya! Now, Turfield proper is... weird. The vibes are cool. It's a more rural town with a fantastic soundtrack. But let's see that map again. This place has no houses, just the gym, the Pokemon Center, and some shop you can't even enter. It's all just corridors with items. I get it's based around Stonehenge, and that's why there's all the rocks, but there are houses back there, we're just not allowed to access them. Though hey, this place has a funny cutout, and that's all that matters. Apparently, in the time it took for Sonya to say, like, 12 sentences to me, Hop went and beat the Grass Gym! Jesus, man, you'll get to Leon's level in no time, especially since you don't get cutscenes every 20 seconds. Well, it's our turn to face Milo now. The gym's lobby is nice and populated, it really feels like we're doing something important. Like, this girl even brought her blip bug with her, that's adorable. So we get changed, and we're ready for the gym mission. Which is just the new official name for the gym's puzzles. We've gotta herd some Wooloo. It's not hard, there are some obstacles, like Yamper that scare them away, but it's good fun and over with quickly. It's pretty creative too, I like how it's more of an active challenge than a puzzle, really. And now, with tension in the air, it's time to fight Milo. Sure seems like you understand Pokémon pretty well. Yes, and that's why no one talks to me. These gym battles are honestly some of the biggest highlights in the entirety of Pokémon Sword and Shield. The atmosphere is sublime. The stadium's packed, Rotom drones fly around the battle, and sometimes we get to see their POV. Whenever a Pokémon's knocked out, the crowd goes wild. And the music. Remember how in Gen 5 the music would flare up and get all intense on a leader's last Pokémon? Well, they did the same thing here, but took it even further. It's hard to appreciate in the first gym because Milo has just two Pokémon, but the song actually has four different phases to it. There's the standard phase. When you're at an advantage, it sounds more triumphant and upbeat. When you're at a disadvantage, this one's great, it really feels like you're under pressure. And of course, the final phase, when the gym leader's down to their last Pokémon, the crowd starts to sing along, and the leader pulls out the Dynamax. And hey, this is when the game actually gives the tutorial for it, so... Dynamax was never too popular, especially when the game was still relevant. But from what I've seen at least, people are starting to look at it a bit more fondly. Though I don't know how competitive feels, what do I look like, someone who knows what uh, Intimidate is? Conceptually, it's kind of boring. We go from brand new enhanced forms for some Pokémon, to tons of different one-time limit breaks, to just making a Pokémon big and increasing their health based on their Dynamax level, which is something that all of us forgot existed. But gameplay-wise, it does add a bit of depth. See, it only lasts for three turns, so you can't throw it out all willy-nilly. It also changes all your moves to max moves, one for each type, and status moves turn into Protect. Every max move not only does big damage, but they also have a unique secondary effect, from changing the weather, adding terrain, or even buffing or debuffing you or your opponent. The stat changes work on both Pokémon and doubles too, so this feels like it was really made for competitive play. But they also made Zacian, so did they really care that much? In a sense, it's kind of like a weird, possibly unethical combination of Megas and Z-moves, and even the devs see it that way. And you know, the combination makes sense, considering both of them were removed from the game despite evidence of the Megas still existing in the files. You know, I just talked for longer than the battle lasted, Milo was a pushover. We add the grass badge to our Sonic the Hedgehog ring. Seven more to go. Seven badges left! We head onward to Route 5, and this... This is where I think Pokémon Sword and Shield begin to fall apart. Does the game have some massive dip in quality? No way! It doesn't suddenly get buggy or get unfair. It's just that we were hit with a lot of new ideas just on the way to the first badge. Not only new ideas for this individual game, but also the series at large. And while yes, this game does still have a lot of good stuff coming up, for sure, 
This is also the point where it kind of stops evolving. It stops being anywhere near as interesting, and that'll be really apparent as we go on. Come on, someone get a rare candy, a firestone, something! We can still save this game! Route 5 is very blatantly the egg farming route. Obviously, there's the daycare, but also this route's just a straight line. Routes 1, 2, and 3 were pretty hallway-like too, but come on, look at this. There is a little area down lower where we find actual stuff, at least, but it seems really tacked on. Like, obviously the route needed something, so this was the solution. There's not even a trainer or anything blocking us from above. This part's completely optional. Well, at least the daycare has something for us. A free Toxel, otherwise known as our fifth party member, Remix. Plus, since it's level one, we get some free EXP candies to catch it up. Oh, also, this Toxel's shiny logs for no reason. No fun allowed indeed. Whoa, it's Team Yell again, trying to steal a bike from... A, a, a doctor? They say they're gonna ride it to chase around gym challengers, and I don't know, that's just a funny mental image. Being Team Yell, they weren't tough, but the battle impressed this guy enough to give us the bike. And it sure is a bike in a Pokemon game, but this time you can press B to do a speed boost, and it makes you look like a chemical hazard. This bridge here actually has a pretty cool view of the other half of the wild area and the city of Hammerlock. It's a really cool way to not only tease what's coming up, but also make the world feel a lot more interconnected. So it's a real shame it's the only time they do something like this. Hey, Hop seems to like it too, because he's there. He's threatening you with a battle here, just like a competitive friend would. Him and Nimona would be great friends. The battle isn't hard because Remix has Nuzzle and I really enjoy being annoying, so we win quickly. But I want to point something out real quick. Here, the battle background is a bridge, as you'd probably expect from a place so... bridge. But that Team Yell battle from 30 seconds ago was... in a field. Oh sorry, I guess I was in the grass so everything else follows suit. But this isn't the first time this has happened, and it won't be the last. Back when Hop battled us in Motostoke on a bridge, it just used the Route 3 backdrop. And yet, there's a unique backdrop for specifically the battle in front of Magnolia's house. This is like the definition of a nitpick, but in all honesty, it kind of takes me out of the game a little bit. They made lots of unique battle backs, and they all look great. Heck, every single stadium has a brand new design. So why couldn't they just do it a bit more? Eh, whatever, we're in Hullbury now, and this place is pretty neat. It's more of a seaside town, complete with a fishing dock, a marketplace that sells the herbs and the incenses, and even houses you can go inside of. Man, after Scarlet and Violet, simply being able to raid someone's home makes the world feel a lot more alive. There's also a train station all the way up here, even though we never need to go to it, and we already have fast travel. Seriously, this is the only train station we never have to visit. There is the one in Motostoke, but that one is at least relevant with the whole Wulu detour. But Hallbury's is just there and doesn't do anything special. Don't tell me, is this another X and Y scenario? But before any of that, we bump into Chairman Rose and his assistant Oleana again. And he looks chill as hell, I hope we get to hang out and talk about how the apocalypse is a bad thing! Oh, and Bede's here too, and apparently he's working for Rose, and has been for some years now. Not that Rose seems to care. He approaches us and tells us if we win, we'll have a celebration for him to get to know me better! Yes, we are hanging out! Though it is worth noting that he recognized us right off the bat, but didn't remember Bede. That's a surprise tool that'll help us later. You know, I actually found my first ever full odd shiny at these docks, I wonder if I... Did we reel it in so hard we flew back to Route 5? The gym leader's not at their gym, which seems to be a pattern with Water-type users, but she's not far. We head to the lighthouse and meet Nessa! She gives us her League card, which I will cherish, and talk more about later. And it's gym time! Oh look, that Blipbug girl's back too! This gym's challenge is a pretty standard Switch puzzle. We hit the red, blue, or yellow switches to turn the water on or off. Damn, Gen 1 pandering again? It's a decent challenge, I guess, and the water down below looks really damn refreshing. It's Nessa time! Your mind as a Pokémon trainer must be quite refined. It's so refined, in fact, that I beat her whole team by using the same move six times! You know, something I haven't talked about yet is the UI. It's very clean, almost to a fault, but that's clearly what they were going for. They wanted it to look like a sports broadcast, which is extremely obvious in things like the ability cut-in and especially the screen transitions. And look at the spectator mode they use for Worlds even, it's perfect for stuff like that. Of course, the non-battle UI also carries this style over, and being easy to navigate is absolutely its biggest strength. I personally prefer the paint streaks and vibrant colors of Sun and Moon, and the liveliness from the Ultra games, but this absolutely has its own thing going on, and it's accomplished pretty well. Oh, hey, Oleana, don't forget about the dinner date with Rose. Trust me, I would never. Let's go, go, go! So while we admire how neatly the napkins are folded, we re-establish that Dynamax is mysterious, we learn that Rose is working with it too, searching for power spots, the places where Pokémon can Dynamax, we get pointed to Hammerlock to find more of Dynamax's history, which is good, it's not completely aimless anymore, and it's time to go now. Where the hell was my seafood dinner, Rose? Well, I sure hope we'll get back to that later too! Apparently, the next gym leader, Kabu, is training in Galar Mine number two. Brilliant name, so we're off to there. 
and we're there. Going straight from Hallbury to the mine feels weird. Like there should be something in between there. Well, here we are in the last cave in the game. Yeah, caves are such a staple of Pokemon, yet after this one, we won't be seeing any more until the DLC. Kinda lame. It's nowhere near as pretty as the first Galar mine, and its whole gimmick is being filled with water. Not that it goes anywhere, it's just puddles. At least the blue's a nice color? We bump into Beat again, full of himself as ever, and surprise, surprise, we battle. You know, something really cool this game brought back from Gens 4 and 5 was in-battle dialogue. When important trainers like gym leaders or rivals would get down to their last Pokemon, they'd usually have something to say. Something along the lines of, we're going to make our comeback, or wow, I'm losing. But Sword and Shield, and later Scarlet and Violet, actually expanded on this. If you get a super effective hit, some characters might comment on how you mastered type matchups. If you get a critical, they'll call you lucky and maybe even get frustrated with you. And the same thing goes in reverse too, where if they get a super effective hit or a crit, they start bragging about their own skills. There's even lines when they use specific moves, adding that little tiny extra impact to them. Now, I can see this getting annoying, really annoying. I mentioned how you fight Hop 10 times, right? Well, in eight of those battles, he'll make almost the exact same comment about you mastering type matchups, from the tutorial with your starter to the semi-finals. And in his last battle, he has dialogue after every Pokemon he sends out. It's a really cool addition that breathes a lot of life into the battles and characters, and it can be pretty cinematic at some points too. But after getting interrupted over and over in the overworld, and getting interrupted in the battles too, yeah, it can be a bit much. Well, we beat Bead. You're not weak, you just lack talent is a line I want to use from now on purely because of how hard it sounds like he's coping. Going further into the cave, it's actually more linear than the first one. That one at least had some kind of lengthy branches that led to items, but this one has practically nothing. There's a corner we can come back to once we can go over water, so that might end up being something. If you're going over the other water in this cave, you're just cutting corners, you're not finding anything. Well, we bump into Team Yell, beat them alongside Hop, walk for, I kid you not, eight seconds, not counting a trainer battle. We find Kabu fighting those same grunts. He was training his fire types against the water types here, which is certainly a strategy. And he tells us to go back to the hotel to rest for his gym battle. Wow, that was certainly a dungeon that we needed the escape rope for. Actually, going back to resting up for Kabu's gym battle, that's kind of a weird element of this game's storyline, how it revolves around the passage of time. Like, right now, it's nighttime because we're going back to a hotel. And because of that, the daylight cycle just doesn't exist in the main story, outside of the wild area anyway. It starts to work normally in the post-game, which is a funny concept. Oh, congratulations! You unlocked the passage of time! This isn't really a flaw of the game, and considering the story they're telling, times like this do help with the flow. But once you notice, you will not unnotice. Hop also mentions Poke Jobs, which are a mechanic that exists. At your PC, you send your Pokemon off on little quests for a couple of hours to level up, get items, and EVs. The best comparison would probably be the Merc missions from Xenoblade 2, requiring certain types of Pokemon for certain jobs. Or more topically, it's kind of like the Poke Pelago in a way. Honestly, the most interesting part of it's all the unique companies your Pokemon can work for. It's genuinely some really neat world building. I'll send Aft into the Chamber of Commerce, how about the community? Oh, and before we get back to the hotel, we catch our final team member, a Hatena named Gidagadi. With a regional dex of 400 and a wild area that has a ton of Pokemon available at the same time, there's a lot of team building potential in this game. Dare I say, better potential than Ultra Sun and Moon and Scarlet and Violet, even though they also had 400 Pokemon in the regional decks. So remember how I said we wouldn't see Marnie again until right before the third badge? Well, here she is at the hotel where we first met her. She genuinely might have just been staying here the whole time and we'd be none the wiser. She just kind of asks if we want to test her skills, we agree, and we fight! Compared to Hop and Bead, it's really hard to get any sort of grasp on her character. She usually just acts aloof, but has the occasional show of emotion like when we agree to battle her? You know what though, her League card actually elaborates on that a little bit, seeing how she really doesn't tend to emote much, okay. And it also expands on her connection to Team Yell, but I'm going to save that, because her League card also determines how we look at the entire Team Yell storyline, and spoilers, hiding that in an optional text wall is not a very good thing. She was actually a decent challenge though, mostly because of my weak team. And after we beat her, she says one sentence and leaves. Look, Marnie fans, I get why you like her, again, lead card and this, but I'm sure you understand why lots of people don't. And thus we turn in for the night. As it turns out, Hop's already got the fire badge. He might have gotten up early, but considering how fast he did Milo, I wouldn't be surprised if he speed ran, which was a bad idea on his part because this gym mission is actually fantastic. 
It's super unique. You have to get five points by either catching or knocking out Pokemon in the grass in the building. This seems inhumane. But the catch is you're not the only trainer battling the wild Pokemon. Some gym trainers join you in battle, either trying to steal your kill or actively screwing you over by hitting you with Fake Out. So you have options. Take more time to knock out the other trainer's Pokemon, go for a quick kill on the wild Pokemon for less points, or be risky and catch it for more points. This challenge is like the most unique in the series, I'd argue. But as fun as the mission is, it's not hard, so it's Kabu time. I love how serious he is, especially in the animations. He throws that Pokeball with so much force, I'm surprised it doesn't kill us. And that goes for when he's on his last Pokemon too. When he's Dynamaxing it, he quite literally gets a fire in his eyes. People complain about this game's animations, and while I do mostly agree, you can't deny that... Whoa. That's not the normal Scorch. Which means I get to talk about how Gigantamax as an addition feels completely half-baked and tacked on! A Gigantamax form is a brand new form some Pokémon can turn into when they Dynamax. And these new forms don't do anything different at all! Gigantamax Machamp and Machamp but Dynamax have the exact same stats! Wait, my bad, there is one minor difference between the forms though. Gigantamax Pokémon, already tired of saying that, have some of their moves turn into a special G-Max move. Which is just another max move, but with a different secondary effect, like setting up hazards, draining PP, haha, or giving a status effect. Their animations are hardly different from the standard max moves either. Take, for instance, Kabu's Scorch. Well, there it is. It has G-Max Centiferno that puts the opposing Pokémon in Fire Spin. Now, the animation doesn't convey this at all. It's almost one-to-one -one with the standard Max Flare, except with a pattern on the ground at the very end. It's just weird because the animations for other signature moves in this game are fantastic. But wait, some G-Max Pokémon actually did get unique animations for their G-Max moves. But coincidentally, it's only the seven G-Max forms locked to the DLC. Oh, and Toxtricity, but that was patched in later anyway. And then there's what Pokémon actually get to Gigantamax! Well, you know how Megas were given to Pokémon across all generations up to that point, with just a bit of bias towards Kanto and a lot against Kalos? And Unova actually, but otherwise the distribution was pretty balanced. Here, 32 Pokémon can Gigantamax. 12 of those are from Kanto, 18 are from Galar. So for the other 6 regions that existed at the time, we only got Garbodor and Melmetal. The latter of which is event only. And oh, that gets me into the acquisition of these guys. So if you want one of your own Pokemon to G-Max, you better shell out for the DLC. Because in Base Sword and Shield, the only way to get a Gigantamax Pokemon is to catch it already like that in a raid. The Corviknight you cared for and trained throughout your journey? Yeah, no, that can't G-Max. And that's not to mention how for a little while after the game released, G-Max Pokémon were banned from online ranked battles! Plus there's a bunch of little oddities. Flapple and Appleton's G-Max forms look the exact same. The starters and even Bulbasaur and Squirtle didn't get their G-Max forms until the DLC, but Charizard had it day one. G-Max Toxtricity was exclusive to raid events for a bit, even though it appeared on the Geoglyph and Turf Field. It really seems like they had a rough idea for maybe some new Pokémon forms and had to shoehorn the rest of them in to make it a mechanic. Like, the developers said Dynamax was based on European myths about giants. So I can totally see them coming up with G-Max Snorlax and then forcing themselves to make more. I know I just whined about Gigantamax for like two minutes straight, but it's not a bad idea, it has potential! Not enough potential though, we beat Scorch and claim Kabu's badge. With the rain, it looks like I just ruined his entire life. As it turns out, the next stop in our quest, Hammerlock, is across the wild area, so time for Hop and I to go through there again. You know, it's been a minute since we've been stopped by a character that comes out of nowhere- OH JOY! I'm kidding. Kabu catches up to us right before we leave, and he, alongside Nessa and Milo, congratulate us on getting this far, since not many trainers do. I mean, guys, this is Gym 3. But honestly, in-universe, this is nice. It makes the Gym Challenge feel more grand and impactful, you know? Even in spite of how quickly it's been going? From the start of our journey in Postwick to our first badge in Turfield, a lot happened. Four whole routes, a cut through the wild area, the first Galar mine, and of course there's all the cutscenes that came with, which consist of pretty big events like starting the Gym Challenge, meeting new characters, and opening up new plot lines. But from Milo to now, it's been back-to-back -back badges. Root, Gym. Cave, Gym. Though I'm sure things will pick up soon, oh hey Bede. And as he does, Bede starts insulting us, and... Whoa man, my self-worth is already in the toilet, so feel free, but leave Hop alone! He even goes out of his way to insult Hop's brother and the way he throws his Pokeballs. And if we've been paying attention, we'll notice that Hop's been practicing that from time to time. He jumps to Leon's defense immediately, and the two of them run off to have a battle... somewhere. They're nowhere around here, at least. I'm sure he'll be fine. But now, the entire wild area is at our fingertips. Almost. There's a couple islands we can't get to yet, and Pokémon that'll tear me to shreds, but for all intents and purposes, the wild area is ours to explore. And it's cool, but also kinda lame. 
I mentioned it earlier, but at the time, the idea of a vast, open area full of different biomes with dozens of different Pokémon to catch was something dreams were made of. Honestly, even now with Legends and Scarlet and Violet being more open than this, the wild area does still have its own unique sense of exploration. In Hisui and Paldea, you can go anywhere through any means. If you wanted, you could really ignore most of the region design, especially with Paldea. It's way easier to just climb over everything, rather than actually exploring the caves. But with Sword and Shield's more limited movement, it makes every part of the wild area feel more... important. If you want to go down, you have to find a slope to get you there. Even if most of it is a flat plane with almost nothing to explore, barring the occasional item off to the side, but it's fine. The thing is, the wild area just kind of feels like one big route, because that's more or less what it is. You would think a place like this would have tons of varied biomes, and it kind of does? The southwest is more of a forest area, east of there is a bit more hilly with lakes. The road up north runs under a couple bridges, and that's a cool aesthetic. And then there's this weird, tiny, out-of-place desert that makes Galarian Yamask so popular. And it doesn't have that many memorable landmarks. There's the big tower in the first half. That's pretty cool looking, even if you can't use it anymore without buying the double pack. Oh, what an incentive! There's a daycare, in case the one on Route 5 just wasn't enough. Like, no joke, they're the exact same, but I guess this one's a bit easier to use because you can just ride in circles in front of it. I guess there's the Lake of Outrage, which is a cool reference, and it has some rocks, too. Though there is something that makes up for the lack of biomes, kinda. And that's the weather system. The entire wild area has 17 sectors, I guess I'll call them. And they each have their own weather that changes daily. It can be rainy, foggy, the sun can be harsh, snowy, or hail-y. It's a bit jarring when you go from sector to sector and the weather changes back and forth faster than the climax of Pokémon Emerald, but that's not really a huge issue. No, I'd argue a bigger flaw is the visuals here. When the skies are clear and the sun is shining, this place looks really colorful and lively. Again, this game as a whole isn't ugly. Like, sure, the wild area also has... the tree, but, uh, don't look at it, I don't know. But when the weather is bad, which is 90% of the time, everything looks so drab. And sure, bad weather doesn't look that great in real life either. But what real life does have is better textures. That damned tree is only the tip of the iceberg. Lots of the terrain is very noticeably super low resolution. And that's made worse by everything else being different resolutions. Like right here with a lack of shadows and the way the ground looks. This could pass off as a poorly made fake leak. Like this PNG of Zygarde is about as fitting as everything else in the image. And actually more fitting than the berry trees, why are these in a completely different art style? The rest of the game just doesn't have this problem thanks to the fixed camera hiding most of the imperfections. And also by simple virtue of not trying to be a massive open plane, they actually have details. But that's not even the worst of it. No, I'd argue the biggest graphical flaw here is... <sighs> the pop-in. I'm not going to linger on this too much because honestly, it's self-explanatory. The NPCs, Pokémon, and even some overworld objects tend to pop in and out of reality for no reason. Like, it can't be for performance because number one, this system runs Tears of the Kingdom, get real. But number two, way back at the very beginning of the game, the crowd that surrounds Leon is visible all the way from Hop's house. They can render things from a distance, but only sometimes. And applying this to the wild area, it doesn't really feel like much of a wild area when the Pokémon living there aren't really part of the world. The wild area isn't perfect, but it does do one thing exceptionally well. And that is, it makes the Pokédex really fun to complete. Granted, I didn't do it this playthrough, but I did almost five years ago now, and I really enjoyed the process. But what makes the wild area so fun for completing the decks? Well, the shiny charm at the finish line is the perfect motivation, for one. Depending on a sector's weather, the Pokémon there are usually completely different. Plus, there's plenty of static encounters with stronger, usually fully evolved Pokémon scattered all around the place. So if you don't want to go through the process of showing your pet affection, you can just catch those instead. The Pokédex has a feature in this game where you're sort of recommended Pokémon to catch, and it's really fun to look at what you need and try to track it down in this huge area. It really feels like a collectathon of sorts, and I don't think any other Pokémon game, aside from Legends really, captures the vibe like this one. There's even a time trial minigame called the Rotom Rally, and I assure you, it exists! But among all this, do you know what the weirdest part of the wild area is? This huge place, the defining feature of the Galar region, is only visited twice throughout the whole story, plus a third time as DLC. Yeah, not even four badges in, and we're already done here. Okay, now wait, that's not exactly a fair assessment. Of course, you can come back here and go to a couple new nooks and crannies with the water bike, and obviously when you level up more and get more badges, you'll be able to battle different Pokémon. The wild area even has its own currency in Watts that you get from checking max raid dens. You can exchange them with these traders around the place to get things like TMs, different Pokéballs, and wishing pieces that let you retry raids instantly. Like, it's obvious this place is its own beast, it has an economy! But still, it's weird how little presence it has overall. I imagine it might be maybe a bit better if it acted like a hub, almost Lumio City style, 
Though in all fairness, Great Britain doesn't look like this, so that might not have worked great. Though it's also worth noting that in leaked betas of the game, the wild area had a completely different design and looked to be way bigger. Not only that, but there were also buildings beyond just the daycare. It's pretty evident that they wanted to do more with the wild area, but couldn't. And that does suck knowing that the final product is quite literally an incomplete vision. Right before we enter Hammerlock, we see Beat again. You know, I don't think that battle was a Pokemon one. Well, it's Hammerlock time, and this place looks awesome. A town being built around a giant castle is such a cool concept. It seems so significant. There's even a huge mansion here that we can't enter. Oda level foreshadowing. It even has a place called the Vault, dedicated to Galar's history. And you know what the Vault is? A single room with four tapestries. And the only new thing it tells us is that there were two heroes on the darkest day instead of one. I know I'm going a bit out of order here, but it would have been so great if this city actually told us more about the region, even if it wouldn't be connected to the main plot. But as it is now, Sonya and I learn a single new nugget of info about the legend, and that's it. I guess that's not really a problem with Hammerlock as much as it is with Sword and Shield's story. Don't get me wrong, for the most part, I think the gym challenge stuff is pretty good. Nothing special, but fine for what it is. And the B story where the player and Sonya try to piece together a legend that's been lost to time is cool in concept, but it's not executed very well. The majority of these conversations with Sonya go almost the exact same way, just recapping what we already know and adding an extra sentence like, but according to this, the two heroes really enjoy the occasional tiramisu. Oh yeah, Hammerlock is a straight line. We finally overhear what Beat's been doing for the chairman, gathering wishing stars. And apparently these wishing stars are important for the future of the Galar region. See, what a stand-up guy. We make our way into the stadium, just kind of because. This place doubles as an energy plant, which Rose shows us a diagram of for some reason. Oh god damn it, corporate Memphis, go away! We bump into Leon, and apparently Hop wasn't doing too well. He apologized as he ran past, but at least he's not dead. But for now, Leon has to meet with the chairman for something important. How mysterious. I wonder if they'll actually get seafood. On the way out, we meet Raihan, the best gym leader, do that whole vault thing I mentioned, and we're on to Route 6. Or we would be, because Team Yell isn't letting gym challengers pass under the guise of not waking the Silicobra up. I love how they're just being little bastards, but at the same time, we've only come across them in pairs, and they've only ever been kind of annoying each time. Well, it's no wonder they're connected to Marnie, they don't have much of a presence either. Oh, Hop's back. And this, right here, is when Hop's arc starts to get really good. Now, it does stem from us, the player, being terrible and not letting him fight Team Yell with us, which is easy regardless, so... <laughs> After the battle, though, he starts talking to us about what Bede said, telling him that all of his losses are dragging his brother down, and that's why he apologized. This is only like six or seven text boxes, but you really feel for him. We know the passion Hop has for battling. We know he's been pushing himself to get to Leon's level. And he cares about his brother so much that the mere thought of him dragging Leon down is enough to make him doubt himself. Now, you know what would make this moment a bit better? If they bothered to change the music? And no, this has nothing to do with the audio still not getting captured. I fix it after Sir Chester, I promise. But yeah, this emotional moment, as short as it may be, just plays the standard root music. That's not even a problem with just this cutscene. Anyone that doesn't have Sonya and her theme in it has a 90% chance to just use the area's music. Well, the sad moment doesn't last long regardless because Hop runs off and we encounter the Queen herself! Her name is Opal, she gives us her lead card, and she's gone. Wonderful, very punctual. Route 6 is a bit more complex than the routes we've seen so far, but not by that much. The branching paths are a bit meatier, and this route actually has its own flavor to navigation. We can climb on ladders! Ladders freeze time, apparently! I guess it's to make sure wild Pokémon don't bump into you while you're climbing, but couldn't you at least keep their animations looping? Well, whatever, the more vertical nature actually makes this route kind of fun to navigate. We find the Fossil Reviver here, Carolis, and she has a neat design that correlates well to these affronts to God. Actually, a lot of the standard NPCs in this game have nice, unique designs. They're all varied, and they have tons of personality, even in their animations. Shoutouts to, uh, this guy. And this route actually has a notable landmark, this Doug Trio monument. See, this is cool. This is a bit of that region history stuff, kind of like all the way back in Turfield. I just wish it was expanded upon a bit more. We make it to the next town, Stow on Side, and while the theme is cool, it's really small. You can make your way onto the rooftops to find items though, and that's super unique. That seems to be a theme in this region. Lots of towns and cities have such cool themes, ideas, and even distinct cultures to them, but they all feel just a bit undercooked. Like, Turfield is a rural, somewhat farming-based community, but we don't see much of that. I mean, there's fields, way in the background. That's good enough, right? 
Plus, I already mentioned Hammerlock, and we'll absolutely see more cases going forward, let me tell you. It's really cool how the towns and cities correlate to the real-life UK, though. Hullbury can be compared to the city of Hull, being a port city, and Nessa's water-type gym might be in reference to The Deep, a notable real-world aquarium there. Motostoke has ties to Manchester, with its super industrial design coming from Manchester's ties to the Industrial Revolution. Winden? Like, come on. Considering just how many times the devs mention Galar's inspiration in interviews, yeah, I'd hope they get it accurate like this. I asked on Twitter what people liked about Galar as a region, and a majority of the responses were praising the culture, and I do have to agree. Especially the in-universe culture around the gym challenge absolutely makes the game for some people. And honestly, I imagine I would get way more out of this game if I was actually British. I mean, I don't know, my opinions may hold no value because I'm a Canadian boy talking about a fictional depiction of the United Kingdom. Anyway, stow on side, the fictional town. There's some market stalls with rare items, this mural with a weird crack in it, and there's Hop again, hello! He's still doubting himself, so he tries changing up his strategy a bit. Hop's team this time is completely different from everything he had before, barring the starter he got from Leon. He used to have a Corvus Squire and Wooloo, but he swapped them out for new Pokémon. And remember, his Wooloo was his real starter before he got the fancy monkey from the marketing. Hop boxed his starter because he thought it was holding him back. And to risk getting all depressing, although I think Hop's done that already, I know that feeling. In Hop's mind, he's carrying the weight of the world. Heck, all the way back in his house, we see tons of trophies and pictures of Leon, and almost none of Hop himself. It's not just that he wants to get to Leon's level, he feels like he needs to live up to him for both of their sakes. Hop's house actually has another small detail in Leon's room. The bed is seldom used, Leon isn't home very often, so Hop doesn't get to see him very much. And that totally puts even more pressure on him. And like, Hop's able to have these thoughts, but he doesn't let them stop him. Even after this battle, where he admits to having bad thoughts in his head, he's determined to get stronger. But out of the way, Hop, it's gym time! Oh, that girl's back, and her blip bug's a dollar now. Neat. The gym mission this time isn't anything crazy, just navigating this course by rotating the analog stick? Have the stories of Mario's parties taught us nothing? But something more interesting about this gym is that between versions... Uh, well, I was going to say it's completely different between versions, but the gym mission is the exact same, just with different colors, and Sword has fists to hit you while Shield has demon hands. The gym leader, though, completely swaps out between versions, with Sword having B in her fighting types? and S.H.I.E.L.D. having Alistair and his ghost types. I really wish this was touched on more in-game, because it's not just another quirky version difference. It makes the gym challenge as a whole feel a bit more vast. Of course, the entire gym challenge is still the best part of the game, and I guess that's why it would be cool to learn more about it, you know? Now, as for our journey in S.H.I.E.L.D., Alistair himself has a cool design. He's shy, so he hides behind a mask. He can communicate with ghosts? Okay, so can I. But neither of those are the most important thing about the battle with him. Now, plenty of people say Sword and Shield are easy games, and while I do mostly agree... Uh, how do I say this? I... I lost. Alistair beat me. But I was told this game was easy! I mean, I guess I was pretty underleveled, but I can't really get why. I have been fighting trainers and wild Pokémon, so I shouldn't be this far behind. Well, I have a little theory involving the wild area. Obviously, you're encouraged to go back to the wild area every so often. A couple NPCs will talk about it, Milo tells us to check it out after getting our first badge, but we're not just given a light push to go back to the wild area. We are expected to! And the devs agree, because the wild area is supposed to be something you check back on every so often because it's ever-changing. But in practice, no! Nothing about this place changes aside from the weather. But regardless of why you'd come here, you're expected to level up so you don't fall behind. And maybe that's why the games felt so samey for a while with all the gyms back to back. You're supposed to go root gym, root gym, but sprinkle a bit of the wild area in there too. But ultimately, this sounds fine, right? Just level up a bit or maybe hang behind if you want to keep the game a bit more challenging. It's nowhere near Johto levels of grinding, my lord. But the problem is, if you do want to catch up, the best way to do it is through raids. I didn't really mention it earlier, but doing max raids gives you rewards. Like one-time use TMs called TRs, berries, and the big thing, EXP candies. EXP candies are like rare candies, but instead of just a level up, they give you a fixed amount of XP. And that fixed amount can be really high. I already used some of the candies I got from the two raid battles I did earlier, so I did another one to prep for Alistair. A Togetic. It gave me five medium XP candies, which I then used on Afton, who gained four levels right then and there, evolved into Cinderace, and then completely swept Alistair on the retry. 
Side note, but Cinderace's Pyro Ball has a really great animation. Scarlet and Violet should be ashamed. The game itself isn't inherently too easy. It's just way too easy to get overleveled. Sure, I could have divided those candies up among my party, and maybe this is all a me thing, but I shouldn't have to do a balancing act to keep the game's difficulty engaging. Moreover, raids are a core feature of not only the wild area, but seemingly the franchise going forward if Go, this, and Scarlet and Violet are anything to go by. So I shouldn't have to ignore or sideline a core feature to make the balance feel balanced. Like, if a Pokemon game is too easy and you nuzlocke it to make it hard, that doesn't change the fact that the game is innately easy. Well, after that filler episode, we bump into Sonya who tells us that the mural from earlier is important to the legend. What can one deduce from this? Well, not much for long because a text box happens thanks to Bead. He's trying to destroy the mural to find wishing stars for the chairman, and wait, was he here earlier? There was that big gash here before we even tried the gym. I wholeheartedly do not know if that was an intentional detail, like Bede was here earlier, left, and came back, or if it's just a continuity error. The way he's talking, it seems like he's losing his mind a little- Oh, is that it? Sonya didn't even react, or- Oh. Why'd it do that? He's afraid we're trying to earn the chairman's favor. I mean, you're not wrong, but you don't have to fight us about it. He calls himself one of the elite, showing just how massive that head of his is, before Rose shows up and immediately expels him from the gym challenge for, you know, destroying a historical monument. The thing is though, Beat thinks he's doing what's best here. He's craving Rose's approval so much that he'll try to earn it through whatever means necessary. Rose doesn't even seem mad, he's disappointed. Rose raised him, had genuine faith in him. Or manipulation, it was probably manipulation. It gets even worse when Sonya casually drops that, oh yeah, Bede's an orphan. Rose is all Bede has. Through grooming or not, Bede wanted to make him proud, and now he has nothing. But still, knowing how Bede tends to be, he'll find his way back into the spotlight even after dropping out of the race. But wait, and after everyone leaves, the mural starts crumbling because Rock is weak to steal after all. Oh my god, it's the box art! Yep, those two heroes were actually Pokemon this whole time. But after dealing with them in competitive for years and buying the game, you knew that was coming. Again, it's cool how the story focuses on unraveling history that was lost to time, or in this case, quite literally covered up. I just wish it was executed a lot differently. Well, no time to dwell on that because we're in the Glimwood Tangle. This place is super neat. It's the most winding, maze-like area in the whole region, but that's not saying much. A lot of that comes down to just how dark this place is, and since Flash died back in 2013, we have to use these mushrooms to light the way, which look absolutely fantastic, by the way. I also think these mushrooms are the only case in Galar of a root having a gimmick, aside from the ladders. There's nothing else like deep mud or tightrope walking. Weird. The atmosphere here in great, and part of that comes down to this place not having Pokemon in the overworld, aside from a couple impidimp off to the side. That really helps the creepy atmosphere, the idea that anything can pop out at any moment. Who knows, there could be a Gengar lying in the darkness as we speak. As cool as the area may be, it's still pitifully short, so one double battle later and we find ourselves in Balonli. Balonlia? Baloney. This town is the best looking place in the game. It is gorgeous, the glowing neon colors, the twisting trees, all the detail everywhere. Probably one of, if not the prettiest location in the whole series. And it must have been really straining the switch because there's only two houses here. Yep, the best looking place in the game, and there's two houses, a Pokemon Center, and a gym. This is what the layout looks like. This place is nothing, it deserves so much better. Oh, hey Marnie, it's been a while. Not genuinely, where does she go? Hello again, Dottler girl. This gym's mission is apparently very serious, so... What, you want me to bring out Landorus Therian? Go get Incinero already? No, this is a quiz, or more accurately, an audition. And that's actually a pretty cool historical reference because Baloney is based on the town of Stratford-upon-Avon. And that's where William Shakespeare came from, therefore it's like we're auditioning for a play. Opal, the current gym leader, is old and she's looking for a successor. During the trainer battles, you'll be asked a handful of questions, kind of like an interview. And depending on your answer, your stats will either go up or down. Of course, since this isn't my first rodeo, I got everything right. I, I, I mean, it's because I am smart. You even get asked questions during the battle with Opal herself, too. How old am I? Here, I'll butter her up and say 16, maybe earn myself some worthers. On replays, pretty much all the challenge is gone since you know all the joke questions by then, but it's still a fun time regardless. I love her Dynamax animation too, it's so cartoony. Well, we didn't qualify to become the next fairy gym leader. Not like we could, we're stuck in this ugly, non-pink uniform. And according to the map, there's no way to go but back. Well, Opal needs to go to Hammerlock too, so we grab a flying taxi together. Or not. No one mentions the flying taxi, and it just fades to black, so... You think Opal was climbing the ladders on the way back? Oh yeah, that thing with Bede happened. He wants to convince the chairman to let him compete again, but... Bede. Buddy, you deserve better than that. And it seems Opal agrees. She comments about how in-depth he is. Like, Bede's not only in-depth, he's also pink!
Whenever I see this scene, I can't not notice that it uses the same sound effect as Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator. Since Bede now doesn't have a family or a Chairman Rose, Opal takes him in, and that's the last we see of him. No, really. In the main story, before the post-game, we don't see Bede again until one last battle during the championship bracket. Having some of his development happen off-screen isn't bad, it makes his comeback a lot more impactful, but we still have three badges left, and Bede won't be there for any of it. It's also worth noting that across the entire game, Bede and Marnie are only on screen at the same time, twice. The first time before the opening ceremony where they're on opposite ends of the room, and the cutscene right before the credits roll. It really feels like they're fighting for screen time, with Marnie only appearing like three times before this, and with B leaving, only now does our Team Yellark start to kind of kick in. Well, none of that stops us from heading east, because Sonya stops us instead! Oh no, not again! It seems like it came from the gym and or power plant. Leon rushes in and tells us that Rose is testing something, and apparently, it could cause Pokémon to Dynamax at random within the city. That doesn't sound ideal. So we're ready to spring into action, and... Oh. Leon and Sonya handle it. So you know how way back in the slumbering world I said that Leon coming to save us was a bit of a red flag? Yeah, well, this is that again. I've mentioned a few times how the progression feels like gym, root, gym, root, back to back. Well, this might have broke it up at least a little. You know, like checking Valley Windworks in Sinnoh or the Lake of Rage in Johto. But unlike those cases, we do know something mysterious is going on, but we're not allowed to investigate it. And this isn't even the worst case of that. We'll see the worst case of that. Hop seems to be in better spirits, so we meet him on Route 7, beat him, and go on our merry way. Though it is worth noting he's still using his team without the Wulu, so he's not 100% yet. His eyes are still on the champion spot, though, but not just that anymore. Hop's goal isn't just to become champion, it's specifically to prove himself and defeat Leon. He even expands on how he looked up to Leon when he was younger, seeing him as a shining star. It's a really sweet scene that, admittedly, kind of comes out of nowhere. Like before, Hop was just kind of coasting along. Hell, even back in the wild area, Beat states that Hop doesn't really have his own thing going on or any sort of goal for himself. And here he is with that goal after just another random battle. Again, it's not a bad moment, but it deserves a lot more impact than it's given. Route 7 is pretty much just an intersection between Routes 8 and 9, so that was Route 7, folks. Give it a round of applause. Route 8 is a lot meatier, bringing back the ladder mechanics from Route 6. And it also brings back the more sandy look, but this time with some ruins, so... I wonder if it was moved at some point in development, I'm genuinely curious. Thing is, this route is deceptively linear. It's so visually busy and nice looking that it seems like there's a lot more going on when there really isn't. It's yet another straight shot from beginning to end, just a bit more zigzaggy. Okay, I know I just complimented how this place looks, but what's with the stretched out textures on the rocks? It's gross. I like how they made Phalanx go through the holes in the walls here, easily the coolest thing they did with overworld Pokémon in the game. And speaking of overworld Pokémon, I haven't mentioned brilliant Pokémon yet! Sometimes a Pokémon in the overworld, or even fishing spots, will have a yellow aura. And if they do, then that means they have better IVs, and egg move, and even higher shiny odds. They're a neat addition to spice up finding Pokémon a bit, but also, they're kind of just Dexnav if Dexnav sucked. Well, Route 8 didn't take very long, so now we head on to... Uh, route 8! This is still the same route somehow! I mean, the snowy part isn't long, and it does lead into the snowy town... Is this a UK thing I don't get? Eh, it's memorable at least, and it kind of ties into Gordy and Melanie's types, so that's neat. A place that's a bit more geographically sensible is Sir Chester, and I like Sir Chester. This place is pretty cozy, and it actually has a bit more to it than the last few towns. Of course, it has a super strong identity, not only with the snow, but also the more old-fashioned looking buildings. There's a big hot spring with ties to the lore, and it makes for a nice set piece. No grannies this time though, I wonder why they removed that. But there's also two hotels where you can invade rooms as you please. There's a cute sequence with a detective trying to find out who ate some berries. Ah! Some guy with a lot of Pikachu. And this is where we find the Game Freak staff this time around. The director, he of course gives you the shiny charm after you finish the decks, but even just by visiting him as we are now, he gives us the catching charm, increasing our chances of a critical catch. There's even a secret battle here with Shigeki Morimoto after you beat the champion. Which is great, because this game needs all the post-game content it can get. The gym's still the priority for now though, and Hop thought so too, because he battled and lost. He says he's just trying to copy Leon's strategy when he should have been himself the whole time. He may have found his own goal, but he still can't separate himself from other people. I'm telling you, one of the best characters in the franchise. This gym, just like the one in Stow on Side, is different between the two versions, with sword fighting Gordy and his rock types, and shield fighting Melanie and her ice types. And this change in leaders actually has a bit more lore behind it, though only if you're playing shield. 
Melanie's rare league card elaborates on it a bit later, and don't worry, we'll get to league cards, but I don't think Gordy ever mentions anything equivalent in Sword. Anyway, the two of them are mother and son, they had a fight, and I guess the victor took over the gym, but that's not really clear. But it's still kind of neat, almost like the parallel universe stuff Sun and Moon had going on. Now the gym's mission is pretty great. You're holding out dousing rods to sense pitfalls, and weirdly enough, this is the only time a dousing machine type thing appears in this game. But see, this isn't any old dousing machine, or Stoutland. This one uses the magic of controller vibration, which isn't exactly easy to show, but trust me, the controllers are vibrating alongside that visual effect. And sorry to go on a bit of a negative tangent, but this use of controller vibration, the obligatory upgraded visuals, and I guess the wild area, are really the only ways Sword and Shield take advantage of the Switch. Though I should add there is vibration in other parts of the game just for immersion, and it's done pretty well. Now, in my eyes, this game not being some huge leap for the franchise is not one of its problems, but I don't think anyone can deny how it was pretty disappointing to a lot of people for the first Pokemon game on a home console to be mostly similar to Sun and Moon gameplay-wise. And that's especially when coming after Let's Go, which is a fine game, but it played it super safe. So it makes a little more sense when you realize not even the devs see this as a home console game. Rather, they see it as a hybrid game, with playing on the big screen being more exciting, and playing portably being convenient. That's not a game design philosophy, that's the Nintendo Switch. Sure, that quote ultimately doesn't mean much, but I would not be surprised if it did influence their direction, even if in a minor way. Well, mission complete, and it's time to face Melanie. Her battle was pretty easy, I didn't struggle like I did with Alistair, but Afton did get frozen, so I contemplated quitting right then and there. Well, we're done here, so time to step outside and Sonya! We're going to a restaurant to celebrate, and I guess that makes up for the whole seafood debacle. I'm surprised though, usually Sonya wants to discuss Galar lore. Which makes it mighty convenient that this restaurant has another tapestry revealing out of nowhere that Bob was the bringer of the darkest day. Okay, but really, how did this end up here, and more importantly, how did nobody notice? That's like, I don't know, you found Walt Disney's frozen head in a Wendy's. It might actually be there too, have you checked? So this tapestry reveals the final part of the legend, that the two Pokemon that saved the world way back when are asleep right now. But as Hop and I point out, no, they're back in the slumbering world. Sonya's excited for us too, so we're going to discuss it over a meal. There, I finally got my meal, suck it, Rose. But that's not all for our history discussion. We get to learn more than one new piece of information this time, hooray! Sir Chester's Hot Spring is apparently the place where the two heroes recovered after battle. And then Sonya says, who exactly were the heroes that bathed here? Was... Was this a translation error? Is she saying that line vaguely on purpose? We know who the heroes are, that's what we've been discovering. I'm genuinely asking, am I missing something here, or is this just a screw up on their end? Oh, and Hop wants to battle now, okay. I mean, he did warn us back on Route 7. And it looks like he's finally settled on a team with his Wooloo back and all grown up now. And you know what? You put up a decent fight, good going, Hop. We're on to our second to last route, Route 9. But before we can really sink our teeth into it, we bump into Team Yell again. Man, these guys have positively zero presence. It's the first time we're seeing them since Route 6, and the second to last time that they're the antagonists, and it's still just the two grunts harassing someone. Look, I understand that, spoilers, they're not the main villains, but they're still the evil team for the majority of the game, and they don't accomplish that well at all. But never mind that, it's the bike guy again. Team Yell says they're busy cheering on Dreadnaw. You know what? It deserves that kind of support. But I also deserve to pass, so... I guess this scene serves to humanize them a bit more? With them wanting to steal the guy's bike just to get back to their town of Spikemuth, but I ask this in the least sarcastic way I can, why should I care? Well, the League cards might have an answer. We're almost there, trust me. And as thanks, we get the Rotom Bike. Again. But this isn't the same Rotom Bike as before, as this Rotom Bike can travel on water. It might not feel as fantastical as surfing on a Pokemon, but it's infinitely more convenient. And the best part of getting Surf in a Pokemon game is going back across the whole region just to see what you've missed. Like with Unova's Route 17 and 18 stemming from Route 1, Alola's Kala'e Bay, Sinnoh's Fuego Ironworks and Pal Park, and this brings me to one of Sword and Shield's biggest issues. In fact, I think it's safe to say that it's the biggest issue in the whole game, and it's easiest to just say it like this. Not counting the DLC, this is the only Pokemon game with absolutely zero optional areas. Exploration, one of the biggest draws of the series, is non-existent. Now that we have the water bike, there is exactly one substantial new place to visit. Remember the big lake next to Magnolia's house back on Route 2? We can bike around in there. It's not a named location, but it's all we have. Oh, and that side path in Galar Mine number two? All that has is the TM for Mudshot. And I guess there are some other rivers around the region that lead to TMs, but they're absolutely not substantial. Even Kanto, widely considered one of the most boring regions in the series, has stuff like the Power Plant, Seafoam Island, Cerulean Cave. Kalos is considered extremely bare, but at least that has stuff like Azure Bay, Terminus Cave, and the Lost Hotel. The Wild Area has it, 
well, I was going to say a bit better, but not really. There's two tiny islands, Axu's Eye and the one near the daycare, and also the Lake of Outrage, which still isn't that big either. There's not even much exploration within the individual areas. Almost every single one of them is a straight line with a couple branches that lead to items. The Glimwood Tangle's probably the best designed place in the game because you actually have to navigate it. And it's not that Galar doesn't have cool locations, we've seen plenty of them. Heck, it's probably one of the most diverse regions in the series, and we get to see tons of cool stuff too, but we don't get to explore any of it. I've mentioned the backgrounds in some areas, like how Turfield has homes we can't access. And the area that best illustrates my point is the final city, Winden. Look how grand this place is. When you first enter, you see neon billboards, a ferris wheel, a massive stadium, and yet this is the map. A triangle. That ferris wheel, all those buildings back there? Purely set dressing, we have no way to access them. It was bad enough when Alola blocked off things like the lighthouse, which happens here too by the way, but to have an entire city we can't explore. I guess Ultra Megalopolis was an omen, huh? And even looking at the region's map, there's a bunch of stuff that we don't even see. The countryside in the southeast? Well, barely. Any part of the coastline? I guess here on Route 9, but as cool as the idea is, it doesn't really feel like it. There are tons of mountains in this region, and we don't get to explore any of them. Like, look at this one. It's got a unique shape. It's right before Winden. It would be perfect to explore as some kind of victory road or something. It's really such a shame. There's no sense of discovery. Just by following the path the gym challenge takes you on, you'll see everything the region has to offer. Alola gets criticized for its linearity too, but at least that has things to do. And looking at the map, we do go to, or at least get to see a bit of most of these places. Just ignore the golf course down there. And of course, the worst part of it is the mist potential. These areas are some of the most distinct and visually appealing in the entire series. We just don't get enough of what is there. Sure, later games like Legends Arceus and Scarlet and Violet don't have that issue because they're open world, or semi-open world. If you see a place, you will get to go to it, but honestly, Paldea's areas aren't nearly as creative or memorable as Galar's. I would love to see another Pokemon game with a more restrictive design that isn't afraid to let me explore its areas. I don't want to feel like I'm on some guided tour with velvet tape lining the path, like come on man, why is this here? Man, all that being said, Route 9 is the best route in the game. It's actually decently sized, though still not very big. And most of it being on water with stiffer controls and Pokemon everywhere is a bit lame, but the place itself? It's decently open. There are quite a few items here, side pockets with trainers this time, and you can even take slightly different paths to get to the end. You can follow the water either left or right and find different items along the beaches, or you can cut through the snowy patch in the middle. It even has a pretty unique theme, with you navigating between icebergs on a frozen beach. And there's of course the whole bit of all the beach equipment and having people sunbathe in the snow, and I'll say it, it's kind of charming. And the small grassy bit at the end is small, but it caps off the route nicely. Whoa, Delmize, that's a rare spawn, I should go catch it. That's not a Delmize, that's a spike muff. Our next badge should be here, but it's closed. And I think this is the only time outside of the first visit to the hotel that we actually see other gym challengers, aside from Hop, Marnie, or Bead, outside of the gyms. And even then, they're just kind of chilling in the lobby. It's a small element, but it kind of makes the gym challenge feel smaller, more self-contained than it should be. Whoa, wait, Marnie, speak of the devil. She's on a poster here, too. As it turns out, this is her hometown, and she knows a secret way in. Secret, sure, yeah, okay. But as she says, we're rivals, so before she lets us in, we'll have to fight. And maybe I'm being too negative or presumptuous in saying this, but it feels a bit like they added that line to remind you that Marnie is a rival. When we saw her back in Bologna, she did mention watching out for us, but at the same time, we've only fought her once before this, and that was four badges ago. Well, rival or not, she lost, haha. <laughs> here's Spike Muth. And here's Spike Muth's gym. This entire place is a gym run by Team Yell. There is nothing here. And this quote unquote gym's mission is not one. It's a straight line with trainer battles. Admittedly, it is fun seeing all the theatrics the grunts pull, like a series of backflips, jumping out the windows, and those do tie into Team Yell's story, but it doesn't change the fact that the gameplay is nothing. Along the way, one of the grunts forgot to get into uniform, thus revealing that they're all gym trainers in disguise. Yeah, I'd hope so, otherwise what have I been doing this for? It's a charming and decently funny moment, sure, but they're trying to treat it like some big reveal? So it starts to make me question what the point of it was. The concept of one evil or more sketchy gym is great! They just don't do anything with it! We end up seeing Marnie giving the trainers what for, with them apparently being responsible for locking up the city in order to help her win. This is like the biggest thing Team Yell does in the game, and even then, it's still tied to the gym challenge. These games are completely allergic to variety, I swear. But now here we are, in front of the mysterious Spike Muth gym leader. Or he would be mysterious if Marnie hadn't given us his league card before we started the gym, 
Why couldn't this wait until after we saw him? It makes that whole mysterious missing gym leader bit from the start of the game completely pointless. But that doesn't matter right now because here we are, folks, right in front of the most infamous moment in Pokemon Sword and Shield. It speaks for itself, frankly. Or rather, doesn't speak. Piers is animated pretty well, but him just mouthing nothing into the microphone looks really bad. And it's made worse since you can still hear the crowd and his mic's feedback. Why is this scene in here at all? Luckily, Piers' character is miles better than his singing ability. Although he doesn't seem to think so, come on man, cheer up. We actually can't Dynamax here in Spike Muth since there's no power spot and a ceiling, so it's time for a good old fashioned battle. Piers' fight is actually pretty unique, even beyond no Dynamaxing. He has a unique battle theme, and that sounds really good. In fact, I haven't really been mentioning it, but all the music in this game's pretty great. Remember how this game brought back the in-battle dialogue? Well, Piers takes full advantage of that, having a line for each of his Pokémon he sends out, and it really makes you feel the connection he has with them. Though calling out that Skuntank has Sucker Punch isn't a great call, Piers. Well, didn't stop me from getting hit by it. His Ace Obstagoon even has max EVs in defense and HP, so it's a bit tankier than you'd expect. Well, we wrap up, and as it turns out, Marnie was watching the whole battle. Piers wants her to replace him as the gym leader, but she gives him some words of encouragement, and reminds him that that won't be possible when she's champion. It's a sweet moment, and a nice bit of characterization for the both of them. And speaking of Marnie and characterization, and Team Yell in general, it's about time we get around to them. And yeah, without the hidden context, their story is terrible! So, where do you find this context? Well, in the League cards! These things are actually pretty cool! They're not really collectible since you automatically get most of them just by playing the game, with only a very select few, usually the rare variants being more secretive. They work really well thematically, they're sports cards, with really nice and expressive renders on the front. Oh heavens! And some info about the character on the back. I've mentioned this character info a couple times already, and usually it's just some pretty nice supplemental stuff. They reveal a couple neat elements, like how Sonya and Nessa are childhood friends. Some info enhances characters, like with Melanie's backstory and Peony's... Never mind, we'll be at the Crown Tundra soon enough, I miss you. Marnie and Piers' cards, though, are different. The info on them isn't just supplemental, it's pretty much essential to understanding Team Yell's deeper motives. Spike Muth not having a power spot for Dynamaxing isn't just a neat gimmick for Piers' battle. It's also partially the reason the town's in the state it is. Dingy, almost run down, since people won't come to it. And Marnie's reason for doing the gym challenge is to give Spike Muth the attention it so desperately needs to hopefully end up increasing tourism and revitalizing it. And the reason Team Yell are trying to get her to the champion spot through any means necessary is to save their town. Moreover, Piers puts a lot of it on himself, feeling that he's the reason nobody comes to the town. See how that ties everything together a lot more nicely? It makes Marnie an infinitely more meaningful character. It actually adds depth to Team Yell beyond just being troublemakers. It even recontextualizes some things, like the stunts they did in their gym. Those could be pretty eye-catching and they could draw in some tourists. And while some parts of the story are hinted at in some dialogue, it tends to be so astoundingly vague that I don't think you'd get what it means unless you already know the plot. And I guess this opens up a whole new discussion about Pokemon fans not reading. And don't get me wrong, they don't. But there's a difference between having to read to understand the story, and having key character and plot beats be restricted to a text wall in a menu. And also, I'm not entirely against learning information through a text dump. Like in Black and White 1, Anthea and Concordia can just completely dump N's backstory on you at the very end of the game. But the difference there is that everything about N and Getsis that's important to the plot is told to you during the plot. So yeah, Team Yell, Marnie, especially Piers, they're alright. Almost every facet about their execution, not so much. And that's it for this storyline, but the energy hasn't died down just yet, something bad's happening! And you know it's bad because the Kaboom text box is back. Whoa, Leon's here! And he's gone to go deal with whatever's going on. He runs off into the tunnel, but we're not just going to stand here, we had like three Kabooms there, this is dire! We push past the crowd and Hop's here too! Apparently Pokémon are Dynamaxing left and right! Huh, that sounds like what Rose was doing earlier. So there's no time to waste, come on Hop, let's- Oh. A JPEG. Leon handled it. We've been doing nothing but fighting gyms back to back for hours now. No evil hideouts to raid, no weird things we get to investigate, and when something intense does happen, we don't get to see it. I've already mentioned it countless times, but there's another massive flaw beyond just the exploration. This game's pacing is abysmal. It was pretty great at the beginning. Lots of stuff was happening. We spent quite a while gearing up for the gym challenge. Things were escalating. We were building up to stuff. But then it fell straight into the root gym cycle. Maybe the occasional battle with Hop. Sometimes Sonya will talk about lore. It gets genuinely tiring when nothing's shaking up the format at all. And the worst thing is, there are chances in the plot to do that. Things do happen, but Leon always handles them. 
Luckily though, this does improve a lot around the end of the game. In fact, I'd call the climax one of the best in the series. Now that doesn't fix the other 20 hours, but not all hope is lost. My patience is though. Whatever, we have one more badge to go, and there's not even a route in between this one. We're right back in Hammerlock, okay. Oh, hey, Sonya. Hey, Leon. Did you have fun? At the very least, we've established a looming threat now, since the red Dynamax light could reappear at any moment. We've only just established a threat after the seventh badge. Okay. Magnolia even gives her input on... Wait, Professor Magnolia? We haven't seen her since Route 2. I thought she died off screen. Apparently, Chairman Rose called her to find out more about the red light, all while worried about the future of the region. But that's not our problem right now. The red light that caused Pokemon to Dynamax is connected to the Darkest Day, which also caused Pokemon to Dynamax. No way. And even when Hop and I offer to help because things could get dangerous at any moment, we're declined. I'm tired. Time for our battle with Raihan, but not after the gym mission, of course, which feels like it was kind of tacked on last minute. At least we got to see Dotler Girl again. So we head back to the vault. Remember that place? And just battle three trainers. That's the final gym mission. Sure, the atmosphere is decently imposing, but that's not a strength of this gym because we're not in the gym. At the very, very least, we do fight them in double battles, and they each set up a different weather condition. Not that it matters, since they only have two Pokémon each! Raihan, though, he does put up a fight. And despite being the Dragon-type leader, his team is more so a general Sandstorm strategy, actually making for a pretty engaging fight. I adore his animations, too. The way he takes a selfie when he Gigantamaxes his Duraludon, I love it. His phone even emotes when he loses, it's great. Well, that's it. The finals are in sight for us. Another quick talk with Magnolia and Sonya. Blah blah blah, we don't know the secrets of Dynamaxing. And then she says we don't know who the heroes were. Am I the one missing something here? We established this! Anyway, Sonya gets Magnolia's lab coat now. Cool. There's actually a crowd here cheering us on after our big achievement. It's nice, this game's weird like that. Great details in some places, like this isn't the first time a crowd's shown up to cheer for us. But then, no detail in others. We head to the station, Hop defeats Raihan in like three minutes, as he does, and we jump on a train. There's the same cutscene as when we went to the wild area, just about wind in this time, and also... broken animations? How does this happen on accident? Like, it's a small thing, but you won't unnotice it. Wait, actually, there is one added bit of animation at the end, but it's still so bizarre. But before we're at the last stop, we have one final trial. Route 10. Yeah, just 10 routes, the lowest amount in the series. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's pathetic. The music is great, it sounds appropriately intense for where we are in the story, but the route itself is... nothing! We've seen the snow theme already, in the route right before this one! Hell, the victory road in Alola, the last game, was snowy too! Now how about that layout? It's about as complex as Route 3. Another straight line, painfully short with just a couple trainer battles peppered throughout. This would have worked fine for a lead-up to Victory Road, but no, for all intents and purposes, this is the Victory Road. I guess it's better than the lead-up to Paldea's Pokémon League, but at least that had Tandemouse. Although, I will admit, Winden's reveal is pretty cool. You go over the hill and see this massive city expanding before your eyes. There's even unique music that I think only plays during your first time doing this. Now, Wind in itself, I already talked about. It's really nice looking, but it's really small, and the pop-in on the NPCs does not help. There's a walkway along the river with nothing on it, a little park on the right, some houses to visit. Yeah, I guess the battle tower goes here in the post-game- whoa, whoa, wait, spoilers! Well, right now, we're here for just one thing, the semi-finals with the other gym challengers. Whoa, Dollar Lady's finally become Orbital Lady! She's such a small, but nice inclusion. I love how she goes from, if you beat Milo, I'll remember your name, to actively being our fan. Marnie's even here, psyching herself up. And Hop at least mentions Beat, so it's kind of like him and Marnie are in the same room again. One ESPN transition later, and it's time, with Marnie up first. She says there's been a lot between us, and on one hand, Yuri win. But on the other hand, uh, no, you showed up like four times. She has a new remix of her battle theme, which adds to how climactic this moment is. The stadium helps with that too. It's huge. The stands are packed and the crowd is louder than ever before. But Marnie's no match for Mother 3. How could she be? This one has Kumatora. And that brings a rather unceremonious end to her story. She does play a kind of small part in the climax, but for all intents and purposes, Marnie's arc is over before it even got the chance to start. She deserved so much better, man. And next up, Hop. We've traveled all this way together, and everything is getting decided here and now. He's not as energetic this time either. He's locking in with a pat on the face and a brand new battle theme that's... Oh, it's so good. A fantastic remix of his old one, really displaying how far he's come. He's still not much of a challenge, though. And of course, it ends how it began. Scorbunny versus Grookey. I love how he stumbles while Dynamaxing his Pokémon, showing that this is still the same old hop after all this time. Actually, that sounds kind of malicious. What if he fell over? But for as easy as he is, you feel it when he loses. He tenses up, trembles, and then thanks you. 
His dream is over. Though unlike Marnie, Hop does still have more time in the spotlight coming up, but that doesn't make this moment any less emotional considering what he's been telling us throughout the story. And it's pretty refreshing to see a character get a happy ending eventually, but not necessarily the one they were aiming for. I would say something like that's life, but I don't want to start putting this shit up, so let's move on. So we head out and Leon apparently started tearing up over that battle? Yeah man, me too, but probably not for the same reasons. So he invites us to dinner to celebrate. I'm already over the seafood, so this is just the cherry on top. Hop and I head over to the hotel to rest up and wait for him, and there's a small interview segment here that's pretty bizarre. They ask you a couple questions before Hop tells them to go away. Your answers don't matter at all. Taking interviews throughout the gym challenge might have been a unique way to expand it all. Heck, these guys, Gillian and Cam, are actually recurring characters, fighting you at a couple points. It's just another one of those weird things that they probably wanted to do more with. Like, maybe you could share your answers with other players or something, I don't know. Then several hours pass, which is another weird thing. They didn't just forget about the passage of time in the story. No, since we haven't rested at any hotel since Kabu's gym, the implication is that we got our third badge and dealt with everything from there to Winden in the span of an afternoon. It's really not a massive deal, but why establish this way of framing the story before throwing it and ignoring it for 40% of the game. And even worse, Leon isn't even here yet! Then Piers shows up and... This is when the story gets... really weird? Not totally bad necessarily, but it feels like there's a lot missing here. Like, this entire upcoming section feels like it's placed out of order. According to Piers, Leon's headed to Rose Tower. Chairman Rose's... Tower. Okay, that's not surprising, they've had meetings before, but Piers makes this face and wants to have... fun? And Hop wants to cause a ruckus? I have been kind of skimming over story scenes while talking about them, but I'm not leaving anything out here. It escalates just like that. See, we the players know that Rose is shady. Like, the game has been out for five years. He's the bad guy. whoop de doo But Piers and Hop don't, so they're just risking their own livelihoods. And in Hop's case, he's risking Leon's too. You could argue Piers is doing it because he's mad about how Rose handled the Speckmuth situation, but the moment still comes completely out of left field. All Leon is even outside saying pretty much exactly that. They're in a meeting, don't bother them. And then she makes a game out of it by having us track down a staff member holding a key to the tower? She says it's because Rose likes games, and I guess that shows her undying dedication to Rose, but why like this? Well, at least this is a neat little mission. We have to find the staff member with the black sunglasses, which is a pain with the poppin', and also, this is how I was playing the game. Each time we find him, we do battle, who would have guessed? I like this stupid finger wag, who does he think he is? Now these battles actually have a unique gimmick with Marnie and Team Yelp cheering you on to boost your stats. This would be kind of cool if it mattered even remotely. So you have to find him three times and each time he only has two Pokemon and it's stuff like Durant and Pharaoh Seed, so the buffs don't matter, you're going to win anyway. This would have been a cool mechanic if it was used in a more climactic moment. Him hiding in the telephone box is a good bit. On my first playthrough, it took me like half an hour to find him. I probably should have kept that to myself. Eventually, he ends up running into the train station, blending in with three conveniently placed clones. But luckily, Piers is here, and since he's so awesome, everyone rushes down to see his performance. And amidst the chaos, we get ourselves the key. And I could say something like, how did Marnie get the key if she's just standing there? But I'm far more distracted by the text box being at the top of the screen, it doesn't do that very often. We find ourselves at the foot of Rose Tower, where Marnie and Piers split off. So it's up to Hop and I to... Save the day, I guess? Reminder, all Hop and I know is that Leon's in a meeting. Well, at least the atmosphere in the lobby is pretty foreboding. I like it. Shout out to the receptionist who flat out doesn't care. <laughs> We're not getting in that easily though, of course. We're caught by the staff and the music shifts into... I don't know what to call this. It's like cheerful, almost sounding like an anime opening. And Rose Tower isn't really much of anything. It's just multi-battles with Hop back to back until you get to the top. He even heals your team after every battle, so there's no sense of tension or stakes. Not that there were stakes to begin with, because there's no threat here. What are we doing? Imagine if this was like a Sylphco thing, a proper dungeon, I don't know. Sylphco blows chunks, but at least it would have been a bit more impactful. So we make it to the top and... Hey, Oleana. Look, I'm not in the mood for this right now, so can we- oh, never mind. She finally snaps, absolutely refusing to let us interrupt the meeting. She also says that beating us would leave Leon with no one left to battle, thus making him more susceptible to Rose's propaganda? Now, not only does this imply she's going to kill us, but also, no, we're not the only people in the semifinals. Again, this whole segment just seems completely out of place. So we battle, and Oleana's team is actually a pretty cool case of storytelling through, well, a team. She uses four Pokemon that could be regarded as beautiful to some individuals, Frostlass, Serena, Salazzle, and Milotech, before ending off with Garbodor, showing her true obsessive, rotten personality beneath all that. Alternatively, Trubbish was her first Pokemon, so maybe she sees beauty in it, or she keeps it as a reminder of her upbringing? I don't know which one's more true, because Oleana's backstory is never set in-game, only in the Twilight Wings web series. I guess there's this one line of dialogue, so make of that what you will? Like, I'm not saying Twilight Wings isn't canon, I just don't know what the original intent was. Whatever, she's defeated. And we found Leon and Rose. They were nowhere to be seen during that battle, but whatever. 
We get a gorgeous hand-drawn cutscene of Rose explaining his plans. I wish they did more of these. This is great. Although they probably just couldn't make the scene work in Engine. They're not agreeing. And we learn that in 1,000 years, Galar will be out of energy. And this is really getting to Rose. Six-year-old me when I learned the sun would explode in a billion years. We don't quite know what he's doing, probably in relation to those experiments from earlier. So we rescue Leon, I guess, and head off to dinner. It's like 10 p.m. I don't want it anymore. But not before Rose steps aside and ominously says he's going to change the course of history. Whatever happened to this guy? He was nice. I miss this guy. It's finally time for the finals, and every gym leader is here ready to partake in the tournament. The finals are essentially this game's replacement for the Elite Four. And while some people might be disappointed we're not fighting four new trainers, in the context of Galar and the gym challenge, this is probably the best outcome. But right before we can start the bracket, Beat comes back! And Opal turned him gay? Gayer? He acts a little bit softer now, but he's still the same Beat at heart, crashing a major sporting event just to get back at us, even staking his future as a Pokemon trainer on it. So naturally, we fight. For whatever reason, he doesn't get a new theme like Hop and Marnie did, even though he probably deserves it more. Like, he doesn't even use the same types anymore. But going from Psychic to Fairy didn't make him any stronger, and my Hatterene finishes off his Hatterene because mine's named Gedagadi and his isn't. Well, that should have been it for Beat, but after some encouraging words from the crowd, he, as the stubborn guy he is, just can't help but keep going as the new fairy type gym leader, thus closing out his arc. It's a pretty nice conclusion for a pretty great character. Beat's moved away from being Rose's underling to make himself a new place in the world. And a subtle, possibly unintentional, but very neat detail, Beat's new fairy type is weak to steel type, the type that Macrocosmos specializes in. He's finally distanced himself from the people that would end up hurting him. Damn, man, should have saved some of that development for Marnie. Now, after we were so rudely interrupted, it's time for the actual finals in the form of this bracket. The gym leaders you face are the same every playthrough, but during the post-game, they're completely random, and it's a pretty cool way to do Elite Four rematches. First up is Nessa. These battles have a new remix of the gym leader theme, complete with all the different phases, too. And as with Hop and Marnie's new tracks, a new version of a song you've been hearing throughout the game is a great way to make this feel climactic. Next is Alistair, or B if you have Sword, and he's not as tough this time around, so we beat him without much of a struggle. And last, Raihan. He beats Piers in the bracket, probably because Piers refuses to Dynamax. You know what, Piers, I respect it. Raihan's team this time is strangely way less cohesive, which kinda stinks. I get we're doing a single battle this time, but instead of going for a Sandstorm strategy, he tries to use Sun, Rain, and Sandstorm, and it's just not very challenging. Well, we did it. Hop comes in to cheer us on for the fight with the unbeatable champion. The air is tense, our Pokémon are ready, our entire journey's flashing before our eyes, and wait, isn't there a plot point we haven't resolved yet? Hey, hey, there he is! Chairman Rose finally reveals his plan. To save Galar's future, he's bringing about the darkest day. And thanks to the sheer amount of Dynamax energy he's hoarding, power spots start erupting across the region, spewing Dynamax energy and forcing Pokémon to grow big. That's not good. And this entire scene is why Rose is a meme. He's interrupting the biggest match in the region to announce that he's bringing about the apocalypse to solve a problem that won't be a problem for another thousand years. It really is just that one element that makes Rose completely fall apart as a character. He is shown to be capable of being kind sometimes, and he does seem to genuinely care about the region and its inhabitants, at least a little bit, even if sometimes he goes a bit far. And like, bringing about the darkest day isn't something he does for his own gain. This isn't a Lysander who's trying to make a world with only Team Flair, or even Giovanni who's just making money. You could say he's doing it for the sake of Macrocosmos, but there's really nothing hinting towards that. He could have been an interesting villain, but the energy crisis being 1,000 years from now just makes him seem stupid. Like, even Leon calls him out on it. I don't want to try and rewrite the story or anything, but I can't help but imagine it would have been maybe a bit better if the crisis was, say, five years in the future? That would have made it a lot more of a moral dilemma. We could better understand Rose's side of the argument. There could even be some cheesy moment like, we don't need to summon the darkest day to save the region, we just need to work together. Anyway, as for the story that's actually in the game, we get the hell out of there! The darkest day has already begun, and Leon runs off to confront Rose. Hop and I, though, we actually get to do something! We call back to the history Sonya learned with us. We know how the heroes stopped the darkest day, we know we saw them, and we know we're heading back to the slumbering well to find them again. Honestly, this is a pretty nice way of tying everything in the story together. The gym challenge and the lore finally meet, and we're heading back to where we were at the very beginning. With a final send-off from Sonya and her mom, which just uses the normal music for Postwick, which feels odd considering the circumstances, we dive back into the Weld. We pass through the area we did before, but before long, we come across a brand new area with stronger Pokémon and more paths to choose. Again, since this is Sword and Shield's area design, none of these are very substantial, but they look really nice though. There's one that leads to a river, there's one that passes over the river. We crawl under and through fallen, decayed trees. Before long, the fog starts to get worse, right before Hop and I see it again. The Pokémon from the beginning, alongside their sister too! Yeah, according to the Pokédex, Zacian's female. Girl boss. And they're gone again. 
And Sonya didn't even see them. Well, mere hallucinations won't slow us down because just a bit further into the forest and we find the shrine. The same one on the fifth tapestry, actually. I also want to quickly add that this area is absolutely stunning. The calm water, the light trickling in from above, the cool colors, it's phenomenal. Hey, shout out to the wild area for single-handedly ruining the reputation of this game's visuals. And on the ground, we find, what do you know, the sword and shield. Considering... well... We are forced to go with the shield while Hop takes the sword. We don't exactly know how these will help us, but we have them now. We book it back to the stadium where Rose is and encounter Oleana very clearly distressed. Ah, so is that why she's moving like that? Apparently her Pokemon was forced to Dynamax, not that we get to see it. And all of this is going down because Rose awakened the legendary Pokemon, Eternatus. It is the source of Dynamaxing. It's what Rose was experimenting on. Eternatus is the darkest day. It's even implied to be relevant in parts of the DLC later, so stay tuned. We head down to the energy plant that gives Kalos a run for its money for just how little of it we see, and face off against the man who never gave me my seafood dinner. The darkest day is in progress, and Eternatus has already broken out. Not that you would know by looking at the region. This is totally just a nitpick, but it's kind of disappointing how the region doesn't even change to reflect the darkest day. There is a new music track that's played in the overworld for a couple areas, and it's appropriately in but visually, all that happens is you're set to nighttime. All the NPCs vanish, giving off a more isolated feeling. Supposedly, there are Pokemon Dynamaxing everywhere, but we don't see any of that. In fact, the Pokemon seem pretty undisturbed. Remember in Alola when Hala was on a stroll to the Laguna? We saw an Ultra Wormhole open, we saw an Ultra Beast come out, clearly establishing a threat. And here, we're just told about it while everything we see says otherwise. What if there was a Dynamax battle where your Pokémon are forced to Dynamax, right? There wouldn't be much to it, but it would be a cool set piece that actually displays what the Darkest Day is doing. Anyway, Rose says it's his duty to protect the future. Cue some of the most needlessly intense battle music in the series. Seriously, it's a cliché joke, but the choir makes it sound like something out of Baldur's Gate. His animations here too are interesting. He's not angry, he's not intense. At the start of the battle, he grasps his Ultra Ball tightly in hopes. He knows he's weaker than you, but he's determined to see his goals through to the end. And if it makes him feel any better, his team put up a pretty decent fight since my team isn't great at dealing with Steel types. And when he's done, he's done. Rose congratulates us. He apologizes for what's happening, despite in his mind thinking it was the right choice. He could have been such a good character. Why was he stuck in Sword and Shield? We head up to the roof to see Leon head to head with Eternatus, and Jesus, it's massive! Yeah, as of five years ago, Waylord isn't the biggest Pokemon anymore, and I'm still adjusting. Leon compliments us on our growth and facing danger. Man, I don't think that was us. You literally didn't let us face danger before. Though that is admittedly a kind of interesting concept. A Pokemon game where, heaven forbid, the other trainers do something in the plot too. Maybe just not to this extreme. Like, maybe have us sneak away alone a few times, and having more of an escalation to Hop and I handling the Darkest Day would kind of tie into the region's theme of growing stronger. Like, I haven't mentioned this yet, but Galar being vertical isn't purely because it's the UK. It also kind of symbolizes your rise to the top, with Winden being, well, at the top. And it also would have made the story a lot less backloaded. I'm just rambling again. Anyway, Leon tries catching it with a regular Pokeball. Yeah, how'd that turn out for you? The explosion knocks Leon out, so it's our time to shine. Eternatus doesn't put up too much of a fight, but it still feels intense, mostly from the music. The tempo goes up and down, kind of like Unova's legendary battle theme. Kind of sounds otherworldly, you know? After we beat it, it gets mad. It shoots up into the clouds, debris starts hovering around us, and we see it. The Pokémon we will never get to use. Meet Eternamax Eternatus! Eternatus is true form, and also the model for the Dynamax logo. We're thrust straight into a raid battle where Hop's double and Afton can't even move. Well, we did pick up the Sword and Shield from earlier, so all we can do is hold them to the sky and... This climax here is the best part of the main game. Dare I say, one of the best moments in the series. Maybe my perspective is warped after all the gyms, all the monotony, but this feels exciting. Zashin and Zamazenta leap back into action to fight the Darkest Day again. The Sword and Shield grant them their original power back, and it's time for the four of us to take down Eternatus. It, it, Etern, it, it, Eternatus. Way to ruin the moment. <laughs> the clouds are swirling above us, the music is powerful, the entire region is flashing right before our eyes for real, and the fight itself is mostly automatic, not that it makes it any less cool. Eternamax Eternatus is a crazy damage sponge, like look at these stats! So Zashin and Zamazenta end up doing most of the damage while Hop and I just supervise. Their signature moves, Behemoth Blade and Behemoth Bash, look incredible though, so cinematic. Though I will point out a somewhat weird bit, raid battles typically have four trainers, not dogs. So wouldn't this moment have worked better if Marnie and Bede were here too? 
sorry, it's just such an obvious thing. I don't know why they didn't do it. This card is a lie. These people are not friends. After holding out for just long enough, we're given the chance to catch it. Or rather, we're forced to catch it. So with one premier ball, we suck Eternatus right in. The sky clears and the dogs head off, probably to die again. It's been three days, but we still have unfinished business with Leon, so we're not off scot-free quite yet. Damn. People tend not to like that part in Pokemon games, how in most of them, the climax happens, and then there's still the run through Victory Road and the Elite Four to go before you're really done. And it's kind of funny how Scarlet and Violet and Black and White are regarded as some of the best stories in the series, and they both end with an actual finale. And as for Sword and Shield, even though it ends with a champion battle after the threat's been dealt with, it's not only immediately after, but the gym challenge is also actually relevant to the story this time around. Apparently, Rose turned himself in after all that, and that's cool. We say Say one last hello to Orbital Girl and head on in. The region is saved, everyone's watching, so as Nimona would say, let's battle our hearts out. Look, Hop even takes the face padding from Leon, he admires him so much. I really want to give special shoutouts to the music here, because it's so good. It might not be super intimidating like other champion themes, but man. The way pieces of the Gym Leader battle theme or Hop's battle theme get incorporated in there, the climax being the crowd chanting the Hall of Fame theme that's been a staple of the series, it all feels so triumphant, and it just has such a sense of finality. And Leon deserves this song too, because he's tough. His team's pretty stacked for one, with Aegislash, Dragapult, the starter that wasn't picked, so in our case, Inteleon. And a lot of it does come from the sudden leap in level two. We're going from Rose's level 57 Copperaja to Leon's level 65 Charizard with only Eternatus in between. And that fight doesn't give any experience, so... I lost. Is that... it? Is the gym challenge over? Sure, Leon might be strong, but is he prepared for two whole raid battles? Well, he kind of was. He was still a really good challenge, especially since Charizard outsped everyone but Afton. But with his Gigantamax running out and one last Pyro Ball, we take the win. The crowd goes wild, fireworks fire off. Hey look, they put the cheesy line in after all. And that's Pokemon Sword and Shield. Oh hey, a mouse cursor. Plus all the fictional company logos at the end of the credits, that's pretty cute. You know, after all is said and done, these games really are- OH WAIT, THERE'S A POST GAME TOO! I love when games get a new title screen after you beat them, and Sword and Shield are the perfect example of that. It shows the team you took to the champion. And seeing everyone all lined up like this, man, I love these stupid bundles of ones and zeros. When we start up our save again, we get a glimpse of the shrine in the slumbering well, signaling us to go there. But not before Magnolia visits to give us the Master Ball. You know, I almost forgot we're usually supposed to get that. Making our way to the shrine, we find Hop, who felt like he was being called here. Don't say uncanny, Hop. He wants to see just how strong we've gotten for one last battle, even though there's still a battle with him after this. Oops. He still has Pink Kirchin on his team, though, so I'm not sure what his game plan was there. Then Sonia comes in and makes a big show about being the professor now. For the longest time, I misremembered thinking she became the professor in the scene where she got her lab coat, but it actually wasn't confirmed in the plot until now, so good for Sonia! A good conclusion to her subtle but still pretty nice character arc. She even wrote a book that reappears in Scarlet and Violet, would you look at that? And she also reminds Hop and I to put the historic relics back because we've just kind of had them in our pocket for the last four days. So before any Divine Retribution, boom, there. And yet, Divine Retribution comes anyway in the form of Swordward and Shieldbert. These gentlemen are supposedly descendants of the original Kings of Galar, and they're our villains for the post-game! Oh boy! They steal the relics, so naturally I battle Shieldbert and Hop loses to Swordward. Man, he can't catch a break! There was even a line back when we fought Rose that implied Hop tried fighting him first and lost. We know he's strong, why is he suffering like this? But in this instance, Swordward makes a comment about Hop not focusing, which, to risk sounding like an evil bastard, is fine. In a character and writing sense, I should specify. His arc isn't totally over yet, and I wouldn't expect it to be. Considering some other parts of the writing, I'm genuinely impressed they didn't have him just get over his dreams being shattered. Now how his arc wraps up is a different thing, but we'll get to that. They start yapping about how we stole their glory, and about how the history that was covered up that we rediscovered was actually for their benefit. That's actually an interesting concept. Too bad they don't explore it in the slightest! Sonia and I head back to the lab to regroup where she has a new assistant and is also apparently hoarding all the Wishing Stars Chairman Rose stole. Are you... are you allowed to have those? But more importantly, we find out that her power spot detector goes off whenever she's near Squidward and Squillium. They forgot to capitalize the F here, I'm just noticing that. So by following the readings, we'll track them down, and these readings are popping up at the stadiums all across the region. And I'm kind of going to break from what I've been doing this entire time. I have been talking about all the events in order, but not only is this postgame somewhat non-linear, but it's also... 
Kind of bad. Turfield is first, though, so we head there to meet up with Hop and... Hey, Piers. We take down the Serena that suddenly Dynamax alongside Milo, and after some words from Sonic and Shadow, we head to the next gym, being either Halberry or Motostoke. This entire part of the game comes completely out of left field. Like, here are some brand new characters who suddenly decide to use Witching Stars to Dynamax Pokemon, even though the Dynamax threat was already resolved, and they're doing it to bring out Zashin and Zamazenta's true natures? Like, I guess trying to expose them for not being the true heroes or something? Also, they can bring back the monarchy to Galar? I don't know how to explain it, it just seems so half-baked. And speaking of half-baked, you know those clips of Sword and Shield's bad cutscene animations? The clapping without actually clapping, the dog's impressive moonwalking skills, and of course, the fades to black. Those mostly come from this post-game. And the Crown Tundra too, but that's something else. You know, there's actually a theory that this post-game, or at least the majority of it, wasn't actually meant to be post-game content at all. Let's rewind back to the climax, right when Chairman Rose announced his plans. The screen shows a live feed of all the gym's power spots going off, and presumably forcing Pokémon to Dynamax. But we never even hear about what happened to these places, save for Hammerlock where Raihan handles it. Heck, Hoppier only points out Hammerlock even though we also see Motostoke, Hulbury, and Baloney. And Raihan says the gym leaders worked together to evacuate the city, kind of implying that Hammerlock is the only place this is happening to? It's almost like they had the cutscene made but retrofitted the dialogue to go with the story changes, thus making the entire sequence contradict itself. Anyway, this post-game where we go around to all the stadiums stopping the Dynamax Pokémon? This would have fit so much better back then! It might also explain why Sam and Cat are the way they are, all the missing animations. They moved these battles to the post-game because otherwise, there would be very little post-game content. And to make it fit, they half ass a story with Swordboard and Shieldbird carrying around Wishing Stars in their back pocket. Now, of course, there's no official confirmation of any of this. This might be what the post-game was always intended to be. But as we know, Pokémon fans, we love to theorize. Anyway, yeah, it's not overly engaging. We save Turfield, then Motosoke and Hulbury. Take a quick stop at the lab where we battle you and Yosuke. Sonya's lab assistant is revealed to be a traitor who gives all the Wishing Stars to the villains. You think there's someone who cried after this reveal? Well, it did make Sonya sad, and I know I won't stand for that. I uh, like how Piers keeps panicking about Marnie and Spikema. He doesn't usually get all emotive like this. Now we head off to deal with Hammerlock, Sir Chester, Stoneside, and Baloney. I guess they shake things up a bit with these battles being 1v1, just you and the raid Pokémon. And in Baloney, Beat already has the Pokémon taken care of, so we fight him instead. And this is a great time to note that Marnie does not appear in this postgame. And neither does Leon, actually. Oh, so now you adults don't want to handle everything. After all those Pokémon are taken care of, Sonya calls us to the power plant and Hammerlock. We get to see Yamper's fade to black ability, classic, and head down to face Shieldbert. He's garnered a bit of a fan base, and we battle. Man, I know I keep talking about the gyms getting tiring, so I should be glad to do something new, but this whole part just feels empty, man. During that battle, Swordward up on the roof blasted Zashian with radiation or whatever in hopes she'd go destroy a town. She, in fact, doesn't, but she still can't control all the energy, so we fight her. And my lord, she does a lot of damage. I totally would have lost if she didn't use Swords Dance this turn. The battle's not quite enough to stop her, though, because she almost kills Hop. His arc would have ended right then and there if Zamazenta hadn't stepped in. Zashian does her funny spin and then leaves, so Hop decides to chase her. I stop Zamazenta from killing Swordward, but I didn't want to. It looks deep into my eyes for a moment. Man, am I glad I didn't pick the rainbow ones way back when. And it's asking us to prove ourselves, so we battle. Kind of anticlimactic, don't you think? No fancy cutscene or anything. Heck, between pressing the A button on the guy and doing battle, it changes forms automatically. I was prepared to spend a while catching this guy, but I got it in five Ultra Balls. I'm honestly surprised because unlike other mascot legendaries, it doesn't have that high of a catch rate. Welcome to the team, albeit for very briefly, the Maventa. And Sada and Turo are done. After what, the dogs being mad for a bit, they go to jail now? Even Piers is tired, and he gives us his rare league card in exchange for not bothering him again. Are you sure you wanted to make this public? Oh yeah, I forgot to mention we got everyone's rare league cards for helping them out at the gyms. I can sell these! Well, one thing left to do, and that's to see how Hop made out. I like the way he talks to Zashian to calm her down, kind of humanizes her in a way. Zashian even tells him he's worthy and that she'll be his Pokémon. Yeah, okay, calm down, N. I do like that he gets the opposite version legendary, though. He deserves it. And what better way to test it out than one final, final showdown? But this isn't your standard super boss or something. During the battle, Hop starts talking. He's felt lost. Leon's not the champion anymore, so surpassing him isn't lofty enough of a goal. His companions are more accomplished than he is, with Sonya becoming the professor and a published author, and you being the protagonist. But recently, he started to realize how much he loves helping people. Then it gets really bittersweet, with Hop wanting this battle to never end. He wants to stay in this moment where he doesn't need to worry about anything else, just the opponent in front of him. But as they do, the battle comes to a close. 
I just spammed Iron Defense with Zamazenta because I didn't want to die to Zacian. And then Hop reveals that he wants to be a professor to help Pokemon. Okay, I still love him, but this part of his arc feels super rushed. Like, when he talks about how recently he realized how much he loves helping people, he's just referring to the stuff that happened in the postgame. It practically comes out of nowhere. And as great as his speech during that battle is, the resolve has such little build-up. It would have been a lot better if even during the main story he showed concern for some Pokémon, like maybe the Silicobra on Route 6. I guess that's just another thing about the postgame that feels weirdly segmented. It's also a nice detail that after this last battle, Hop gives us a hearty handshake just as all the gym leaders have. We're still rivals, but more in the sense that we have respect for each other. Hop even gets the opportunity to work as Stony's assistant, and you know, he parallels Bead in quite a few ways. What with finding a mentor and forging their own paths, which just makes Marnie stand out that much more in a bad way. Here's Leon- oh wait, he is in the postgame, oops. Fredbear and Spring Bonnie were watching, and they feel so sorry for putting us through all that that they proclaim us royalty. Thanks? Leon acknowledges Hop's growth as he should, and the end. There's still a bit of extra stuff to do, like there's the Battle Tower where Rose Tower used to be. I guess this could be considered Galar's only optional area. You get a free type null here and even get to rematch Leon paired with music from the one and only Toby Fox of Y2K fame. Back at Hop's house, there's a free Charmander from Leon, and of course, I named him Leon too. You can find Oleana in the first Galar mine doing community service where she gives you Rose's rare league card. There's a rematch with Marnie in Spikemuth. And she has a secret scene at the Badoo Drop Inn trying to practice her smile, which is kind of cute. This game has its own Ghost Girl side quest, which was available earlier. A little girl in Hammerlock asks you to deliver a letter to Baloney, where the recipient, an old man, implies that she died young from an illness. It's a pretty sad detail. Is that a Reaper Cloth? In Hallbury, the band from the credits shows up next to the lighthouse. Yeah, of course I'd like to see them perform. It just replays the credits. And essentially, that's it for base Pokemon Sword and Shield. It's weird just how much is... missing. I usually don't like focusing on the stuff that isn't there, but even the most barren Pokemon games in terms of content have more than this. There are no optional legendaries. And wait a second, why doesn't this game have title defense? In Alola, since you are the champion, after fighting the Elite Four, you'd fight a random trainer who's trying to steal the champion spot from you. And if you happen to lose, you actually had to go back and fight that person again to reclaim it. In this game, though, all about the gym challenge and how one loss can spell the end of someone like Leon, why can't we lose? If we don't win a rematch in the finals, we're just told to try again. Maybe this is just a for fun tournament and we can't really lose until the next gym season comes around or whatever because that's not explained? Or maybe they just didn't want to rewrite all the dialogue? These games really are tough. They are the definition of high highs and low lows. But those lows are so deep that they really do bring the whole game down. Pokemon games thrive on exploration, so it's still baffling that this game has so little, especially with a semi-open world area. The story has great concepts and sometimes good execution, but it also feels like it's holding itself back. And I can't stress this enough, the pacing is so draining. The gyms themselves are the best they've ever been and probably ever will be again, but doing them back to back with no breaks isn't fun. Now the battles are still fine and they probably look the best they ever have. Catching them all is still a fun time. And some of these characters are phenomenal, but so much else about it feels pretty half-baked. The game just seems to have a weird lack of polish, like with the pop-in, the world around you freezing when you're on a ladder, the times where the story contradicts itself and flat out makes no sense. And I didn't mention this yet, but if you talk to your mom after the darkest day but before beating Leon, she'll call you the champion even though you're not. Sure, that's a small thing that no one will ever notice, but things like that kind of add up. Like, there's no confirmation of it, but this game really reeks of development issues. Remember way back at the start when I said that overworld encounters were added because people liked them in Let's Go? Well, that was directly said by Shigeru Omori, thus meaning they had less than a year to put overworld encounters in. And it actually shows because overworld encounter Pokemon always have a 50-50 gender ratio instead of what they're supposed to have. And that also means their original vision of the wild area didn't have overworld Pokemon? That just sounds miserable. Plus, there's of course the dex cut and no option to turn off the EXP share. Even if I like the EXP share in the game, is pretty well balanced around it, it's more restrictive for no reason. If I were to put Sword and Shield on a Pokemon game tier list, it would go around C. Around the middle of C, maybe higher depending on my mood, but it's still far from the best the series has to offer. Which makes it really surprising to hear that the Sword and Shield expansion pass is not only considered better than the base game, but it also turns Sword and Shield into a genuinely great Pokemon game, at least to some people. Okay, but can we admit Twilight Wings is like the best thing to come out of this game? Oh,